Hey everyone, welcome to the second Azure Cosmos DB conference. Um, Azure Cosmos DB conference is an online event comprised of three three hour live streams across Americas, Asia Pacific and EMEA regions, as well as an entire track of sessions available now on demand. Azure Cosmos DB conference was organized to provide a stage for Cosmos DB customers, developers and community to share their knowledge and discover each other. Each of the regional live stream coming up includes unique content created by local members of the Azure Cosmos DB community. I'm Shweta Nayak and I have here with my colleague Saji and we are the hosts of the APAC segment of this conference today. Hi everyone, I'm Saji. I'm very excited to listen to the wonderful session lined up for today. Before we get started, a couple of housekeeping announcements. Uh, viewers who are watching this via Microsoft uh, Learn TV will be able to ask questions in our moderated forum. Over the next three hours, you can see and hear from customers and community members who have built amazing applications and services. They are here today with us to show you what they have built and the things they have learned uh, while building on Cosmos DB and for the cloud. If you miss any of the live sessions, no need to worry. Uh, these sessions will be available on demand shortly after each uh, stream concludes. In a flash, we are going to start our first session. Over to you, Sweta, to introduce our first speaker. Right. So our first session today is about serving customer data with Cosmos DB. It is going to be presented by Heber. And Heber is a data analytics manager at Grab. Heber is going to give us a brief overview of how Grab is using Azure Cosmos DB to empower the customer 360 API, which is an internal API that serves millions of consumer-centric data points to various systems in Grab on a daily basis to provide better user personalization. Let's welcome our first speaker, of the APAC session, Heber, stage is yours. Thank you. A very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this presentation. My name is Heber, a data analytics manager leading part of the analytics data product team in Grab. Today, I will be talking about how we leverage Azure Cosmos DB to serve individual customers' data to our services. Before we begin on the main topic, perhaps I can give a little introduction about Grab, who we are, and what we do. Grab is a Southeast Asian tech company, a leading super app in the region. Since its inception in 2012, it has grown rapidly, and today it offers mobility, deliveries, financial services across eight countries in the region and over 400 cities. We also provide income opportunities for our drivers and merchant partners, and we aim to empower one in every two daily entrepreneurs in the near future. Now, as you can imagine, having this many users in, on the app naturally generates a lot of transactional data. And given that Grab has multiple business verticals, it is critical to consolidate these transactions into a per consumer level. This is so that we can have a holistic view of individual users' behavior. And this is where C360 Project comes in. The goal of C360 Project is to consolidate all our application users' data, including consumers, drivers, merchants, into individual user level in order to provide that holistic view of the user across all of Grab's business verticals. Its main product offering is internal data store where individual consumer data points are aggregated daily using inputs from transactions and in-app behavioral data. To date, it offers thousands of data points with a coverage of over millions of users in our ecosystem. It is the single source of truth in Grab when it comes to user level data. Having this data store provides a critical avenue for us to do all the fun analytic stuff that you usually do with consumer data, such as checking in on their life cycle, doing churn prediction, segmentation for marketing, and so on. However, as the usage of the data store grows, our teams in Grab begin to look into using this data store to do personalization or real-time prediction. And this requires a very different mechanism for retrieving single rows of data from the data store on demand. 
all the analytical workload that was mentioned previously are what we consider offline use cases and are not really time sensitive. But to provide data points to the online use cases, we clearly need an API infrastructure that we can retrieve individual customer data on demand. So this is where the C360 API comes in. We created a series of API endpoints in order to retrieve data of consumers, drivers, and merchants using Azure API management and function app services. For the backend data base, we have chosen to use Cosmos DB. Why Cosmos DB, you might ask? Why not use something like, say, MySQL? Well, there are several factors that we consider when choosing the backend technology stack. And Cosmos DB has certain features that makes it appealing as the choice of database for our use case. The first reason for choosing Cosmos DB is that it is a no SQL database. Here, data is are stored as documents, with each document representing a single row in a traditional relational database table. A group of documents are stored in containers, which is the equivalent of tables in a relational database. A single document is usually represented as a JSON object, as you see on screen, where the internal views of the objects are, can be loosely structured. Whereas in a relational database, it requires well-defined schemas that are inflexible to change. The properties of a JSON object document in a document database can be easily added, updated, or removed. Why is that important to us? Well, you see, in the case of C360, although we do have many attributes, not all of them require on-demand access via API. In fact, only a handful of those attributes are actively being used. However, we do run many pilot projects, and this often need on-demand access for certain attributes for a period of time. While the pilot project is running, those attributes needs to be onboarded under the Cosmos DB, and when the project ends, they will be removed to save costs. This creates frequent changes to the schema of the document, for which in a relational database can be difficult to handle. Meanwhile, Cosmos DB with its no SQL format provides the flexibility that we need in order to cater for this kind of use cases. That said, being a NoSQL database is only secondary to the next reason why we choose Cosmos DB, which is its incredibly fast point read performance. Remember that our API needs to return individual consumer's data point. This is akin to like reading a single row in a relational database. Now in a relational database, in order to achieve the optimal query performance, you need to do some kind of horizontal partitioning and probably indexing on key columns just to scratch the surface in order to quickly find the rows that you need. However, this still requires the database to engage its query engine in order to retrieve the data. Cosmos DB, on the other hand, provides the mechanism called point read. When using point read to query a document by its ID, this query bypasses the query engine of Cosmos DB and talks directly to the storage layer. This makes the retrieval of a single document blazingly fast. And here's a snapshot of the performance matrix that we have retrieved using logs from our instances. As you can see, our daily calls amount to over 50 million per day, but the average time to retrieve data from the Cosmos DB is just under five milliseconds. Here's a breakdown of the operation duration for requests coming in through the C360 API. Here you can see the distribution of time taken for Cosmos DB to retrieve data. And it is usually in the single digit milliseconds, which is incredible given that we do have a lot of data. In fact, if you look at the P95 latency, 
it comes just a bit around of 5.5 milliseconds. And well, speaking of a lot of data, Cosmos DB is one of the most scalable databases in the current market. As for mentioned, the C360 data store contains the data point for millions of users. Each of these users translate to a role in a relational database or a document in Cosmos DB. So as you can imagine, the volume of data we have is huge. Even with very aggressive cutting of not in use attributes in total, the data can take up to more than a TB. Given that these data points are refreshed daily, writing in the new data into the Cosmos DB is a task that demands large amount of computational power. And this increase in computational power is on top of the normal capacity which we provisioned in order to serve the existing data. However, because this spike in demand of computational power is transitionary, the database needs to provide temporary additional resources only for ingestion. In a normal DB or DB cluster, the operation to increase this throughput may take up to several hours. However, for Cosmos DB, thanks to its auto-scaling containers, this operation can be done in less than a few 10 minutes or so. So now having showcased some of Cosmos DB's strengths, it is not without some downsides. The biggest one being that Cosmos DB does not have segregation between its read and write traffic provisions. Now, both read and write traffic of the Cosmos DB shares the same amount of throughput that is being provisioned. So when one side of the traffic gets high, it will eat into the bandwidth of the other where the other can operate it. This caused us quite a bit of trouble initially since our daily updates writes a large amount of data into the container and that blocks the read traffic from the Cosmos DB. Since our services run online 24 seven, it creates an issue where the dependent services on our API cannot reliably retrieve data from the API during those daily data ingestion periods. To resolve this issue, we actually implemented a rotating container strategy. Each day, the updated data is loaded into a new container, while the existing containers continues to serve read requests. Once the data loading is complete, we switch the API to read from the new container. The old container is then deleted. This rotating container strategy ensures that data retrieval will not be disrupted by the high traffic of data loading. So leveraging on all these strengths of Cosmos DB, we have created the C360 API as a serving platform for our user level attributes. Currently, there are several production use cases that are accessing these attributes by the API. And I'm going to showcase two of them here. One of such use case is to prove is to feed user level attributes to our data science models for fraudulent transaction detection. Here, data points are retrieved by our data science model using a transaction, whenever a transaction occurs on the application, and it will classify if the transaction is possibly fraudulent. We do have a very high daily transaction numbers, and as such, having a low latency API for this user level attribute retrieval is critical since we do need additional buffer time for the predictive models to run. And overall, we want to compress that response time of between the user making a transaction to retrieving data to from the data store and having the prediction model run to under 500 milliseconds. Here, is where the speed of Cosmos DB point read really comes into play, as we are able to serve large amount of requests that are coming in at an average latency of around 50 milliseconds round trip. This creates that buffer time for our predictive model to run, and it allows for a more complex model to run, which takes up more time, which usually ranges to around a few hundred milliseconds or so. And that is critical 
for providing the kind of smooth user experience that we want for our app. Another use case is to provide differentiated customer service for different user segments. Here, user segments are predetermined by an offline data science model, and the results are loaded into the C360 data store as an attribute. This attribute is then loaded onto the Cosmos DB API for serving. Whenever a user contacts our customer service agents, our agents will first check through the customer service terminal, which will query our API in order to retrieve the user's segment. This user segment will indicate uh, the user's classification, and we use that to identify high value customers for priority services. So in conclusion, Cosmos DB has been fulfilling the needs of serving individual user level data retrieval exceptionally. It's no SQL format, fast point read performance, and rapidly scaling capacities has allowed us to create a system to serve such data reliably and efficiently. In our future roadmap, we plan to expand on the capacity of C360 API by optimizing the other parts of the system, such as the function app API endpoint code, and also the network configuration connecting the API management and the function app instances in order to reduce latency further. Additionally, we do hope to look into optimizing the daily data loading jobs. And we do that by optimizing the daily pipelines that are currently running on data breaks. I hope this talk has given you some insights as to how Cosmos DB has been useful in serving customer level data. Thank you for coming to this talk. And before we end the session, perhaps we can take some questions from the audience. Thanks so much, Heber. That was really great. Um, we do not have any I questions have right now. Yeah, go ahead, Saji. Uh, I noticed that you have built it using Azure Functions, API Management, and Cosmos DB, and you mentioned uh, you're handling uh, millions of uh, requests across 20 instances So, with some of the uh, container rotating strategies. So what are the best DevOps practices that you follow in terms of uh, you know, uh, monitoring and troubleshooting? In terms of monitoring and troubleshooting, I think the best DevOps we do use, so essentially our entire development ecosystem lives on Azure. On the DevOps side of things, we leverage on the Azure DevOps instances, which provides the feature called pipelines in order to deploy code reliably onto the function app themselves. And it is it provides the standard suite of our CI CD features that you will find on the other GitLab or GitHub uh, websites. So that is very easily transferable. And so for data pipeline wise, we also do our CI CD for the data pipelines. We have a staging instance of the data pipelines, a staging Cosmos DB container, uh, where we test out whether the data pipeline works in when it comes to ingest data ingestion. And the staging Cosmos DB instance do connect to a staging instance of the API endpoints where users can test out and access the full range of uh, attributes that we have. It is only when the users have test out their production use, their use case on our staging APIs, that's when they can submit a request to us to say like, hey, we would like to access this uh, attribute that you have on the production API endpoint. And that is when we, on the back end, we switch that on, that attribute on, on the production API endpoint. And on the next day, that endpoint, that attribute will be uploaded to the production Cosmos DB data store. So okay, having this it. very clear segregation uh, ensures that our end users have some place to test out uh, whatever they are using before they actually goes into use it, it, it in the production environment. Got it. Thanks. Thanks for sharing Thanks. this insight. Yeah. 
And I assume uh, these are, uh, like you said, uh, and I know that Grab also operates across multiple industries. So your consumers are essentially these other teams uh, within Grab, um, who I assume are from retail, transportation, different teams. Is that right? Uh, yeah, that's right. Our consumers are all the internal teams that are developing product features on the app. Awesome. Um, so do you have to, you know, uh, we provide like five nines of SLA in Cosmos DB um, and how uh, do you provide an internal SLA, commit to an internal SLA for your users? How does that work and how are you able to achieve that? Oh, well, in terms of internal SLA, we mark it by the, laden the round trip latency on Azure mm -hmm. and also the error rate. For round trip latency, we promise that uh, it will be less than 150 milliseconds. And in terms of error rate, it will be four nines, 99.99% uptime. Mm -hmm. So, awesome. so far, we were able to do so uh, using a pretty lean team. It's also partly thanks to the stability of Cosmos DB itself. Uh, we have not encountered any major issues whereby there's an outrage on the containers or, or the service. Uh, and overall, the experience has been pretty smooth in terms of uh, using the service. Awesome. Do you, do you use um, um, single region, multiple regions? Uh, yeah, we only use a single region uh, on the Southeast Asian region mm -hmm. and that is basically where all our businesses are concentrated on so having that uh instance on in the region itself is part also part of the reason why we were able to achieve this kind of low latency performance right yeah uh makes sense and um yeah, uh, approximately I would say um how many how many requests per second uh does your uh, you know workload operate at and uh, I mean what's the scale of um traffic that you're able to achieve with your databases? Uh, well at the highest point it can handle a couple thousand it has handled a couple thousand requests per second. And mm. uh, we are not seeing any strings on the uh database so far. So we believe that there's still room for it to handle more requests per second. We do hope to achieve an eventual point whereby it can handle 20,000 requests per second. Uh, but that is barring that we resolve some bottlenecks on the networking between the different cloud uh, components themselves. So this is currently one of our projects in uh, progress. Perhaps next year when we have a different uh, we have the next Cosmo DB Conf. I we will be able to share with you how we actually optimize the performance of this API. I have one more last question uh, before we wind up. Like uh, you mentioned that you are using Cosmos DB heavily, like, and you mentioned some of the use cases. Uh, since Cosmos DB is a multimodal data is, uh, what are the, you know, APIs that you currently use? Uh... Mm, sorry, I didn't quite get the question. Can you repeat it again? Are you using only the SQL API, Mongo API, or? Ah, we are only using the SQL API. Okay, got it. Yeah, the okay. use case is uh, pretty straightforward. And so SQL API was sufficient for whatever that we need. Okay. Yeah, I think that's all uh, we had on the question side. Well, thank you very much for giving me this time to do my presentation. I hope you have enjoyed it. And yeah, I think Thanks. that will be all from my side. Thanks so much, Heber. Um, that was awesome. Um, I, I do know that, uh, you know, C360 is one of the most common use cases for Cosmos DB. And it is something that is used across multiple industries you know, retail, transportation, finance. Um, and it was great to hear from Heber around how they have implemented the uh, data pipelines um, and are benefiting from their customer 360 solution. Indeed, Sweta, I think I'm sure there are other companies that need similar customer insights for improving their products and services uh, that will uh, certainly benefit 
uh, I mean, from this session. Uh, thanks again for your time, Heber, and it was great to have you uh, here today. Uh, time to jump into the second session. Uh, this time we have an interesting topic from an interesting speaker. Yes, our next presenter is David O'Brien. Uh, he's going to present on the topic uh, startup infrastructure, how to make uh, scaling its uh, sales not a tech issue. Uh, David is the uh, founder of Argos uh, Security. It is a startup that ha helps the customers by finding, investigating, and fixing cloud vulnerabilities. That's right. Uh, David will be demonstrating how they have leveraged the Azure Pass services like Azure Functions and especially Cosmos DB to build a SaaS product that scales effortlessly already and uh, it's already handling millions of requests. Um, he will walk us through how simple it was for him to build the foundations for their product and why they chose Cosmos DB for it and not any other database. Uh, great to have you here, David. Over to you. Hi, everybody. Welcome to my office uh, slash shoe closet slash uh, baby room. Um, so everybody working from home probably knows what I'm feeling. Um, great to be here. And um, yeah, uh, let's jump right in. Cool. So uh, startups infrastructure. Uh, today I'm here to tell you a bit about how we built Argos, a um, cloud security product. I'm not going to spend too much time about um, talking about the product itself. Um, it's not a sales pitch here, um, but I really want to tell you uh, from day zero, from day dot, what decisions did we make to, um, to make sure that we, um, once we hit um, commercial success, pretty much, or once we hit our ex customer, um, that our infrastructure wouldn't hold us back. So we really wanted to make sure that sales could run as fast as possible, as fast as they needed to, and we wouldn't fall into this um, trap of, oh crap, on Monday, um, that, that huge customer is going to sign up. We need to quickly deploy some more virtual machines. So we didn't want that. How did we do that? Quick, who am I? Uh, David O'Brien, you've already um, heard my name. Uh, I'm a Microsoft Azure MVP um, in, uh, for eight years now, I think, eight or nine years. Um, been around the cloud ecosystem for quite a while. Um, and two years ago, I founded Argos Cloud Security. I'm from Australia. I'm based in Geelong, um, top right picture. It's a beautiful city of Geelong in Victoria, Australia. Um, and if you've watched the Formula One just recently, um, it's close to Melbourne. You see the Formula One racetrack down here around uh, Albert Park Lake in Melbourne. I um, also like to fly planes around um, Australia. So that's another hobby. If you really want to get in touch with me and talk about IT, startup, or aviation, <laughs> Um, here's my contact details, always happy to get in touch with people in the community and help them get started in the cloud, be secure in the cloud. So quickly, why did we build yet another cloud security product? And here's a very, very um, strong statement, um, but it always gets people thinking and starts really good conversations. Um, because I believe that even though the cloud, the public cloud, could almost get a driver's license in most countries nowadays, as an industry, generally speaking, we're still getting cloud security basics wrong. And I don't believe, and I've never believed, that that's actually due to us not being able to detect issues, but mostly due to us not being able, from a time point of view, to actually approach or um, address any of these issues that were detected. Case in point, over and over and over again for over 13 years now, as a consultant, companies would ask me um, to come back into their um, environments and fix things, figure out which of the issues that a certain product found for them were actual security issues, and not just best practice violations and quotes. So that's when we started um, eventually thinking about how can we help organizations actually fix the, this issue, help them 
address the security concerns in the cloud. And we had a few um, golden rules, we called them, um, while building this product um, and starting the company. Um, number one, we went all in on Azure. I've never believed that lock-in is a bad thing, especially when starting a startup, you need to be focused. So all in on Azure and pass platform as a service services um, if possible. As a security product, it needed to have a strict focus on security, which really meant to us, again, pass, push most of these concerns over to Microsoft, our cloud provider, because arguably, arguably speaking, at an infrastructure point of view, at an infrastructure level, they're probably a lot better at securing certain things than we would be. Startup, we were bootstrapped, means we don't have any external investment, um, really. That means money is tight, so free tier as much as possible where pass also comes in again. Where we had to buy third-party solutions or we, where we had to use third-party solutions, we decided that one criteria for a third-party solution um, would be they need to have a startup tier or need to have a free tier. Buy over build, um, strong fan, big fan of buy over build, um, Nobody wants to run their own exchange server. That's why we're all buying Microsoft 365, Office 365. Yeah, so all of these things, if somebody's already built it, why would I build, try to build it again? If it's not part of my business, I'm just going to buy it and automate everything. We had a very, very strong stance on whatever we did, we had to get it automated from day one. And this is our architecture diagram, really. Um, there is no secret sauce necessarily, um, except for a bit in the code, obviously, but there's no secrets around how we built, how we architected Argos. Overall, what we're going to focus on today is in the middle, our function app, and in the lower left, of course, that's why we're here, our Cosmos DB data, a uh, Cosmos DB account, and our databases that we use for the back end of our application. So let's dive a bit deeper into that. Um, just generally, you don't see any virtual machines in here. Everything's pass. Our front end at 12 o'clock is a static website on storage accounts. We have not moved that to um, static web apps yet. I'm not necessarily sure if you will. Um, if you've not looked at static web apps, have a look, different topic. Um, we are using .NET Core um, for our application, but we run that on Linux because we don't care what operating system we're running on. So we just went with Linux, um, pretty much flipped the coin and it landed on Linux because nobody should care what operating system you're running stuff on. Our database, as I mentioned, Cosmos DB, that's where we store our customer information, all the things we detected in customer environments. We encrypt all our uh, all uh, sensitive, sensitive information in these databases. And we use Key Vault to hold our encryption keys to really store sensitive information in the end, um, like certificates, other secrets, or uh, we use application insights, lower right, um, for logging, telemetry, observability, all of that, uh, these illities. Um, and then there's third party stuff in the upper right that we don't have to go into today. Um, but we use this application to now scan our customer environments um, on all three clouds, actually, um, on Azure, AWS, and GCP. So to do that, how did we do that? Um, so let's dive a bit deeper into the application itself, the user functions, and specifically then after that, the backend, and why did we use Cosmos DB opposed to um, a SQL database? Um, because that's easiest in, in quotes, because um, you probably find a bazillion 
from blog articles on the internet dating back to the 1990s on how to do a SQL database. Um, so why did we use Cosmos? Uh, one, back to paths and functions and Cosmos, this is what we get, for example, looking at application insights without actually doing a lot and just a bit of configuration using all these services that we are going to dive a bit deeper into, we get this amazing map, application map, the service map um, out of application insights that will show us where there's issues, what issues are there, how many calls, how many invocations, which one's a bottleneck, why is it a bottleneck? Really, really simple for us to dive into our application without deploying agents, deploying virtual machines, configuring IIS to forward telemetry to, to other uh, endpoints. None of that required. All we had to do was put a key somewhere and that was it, a bit of configuration. So the infrastructure itself, the application, as I mentioned, we use the functions. We started with the consumption plan, the dynamic consumption plan for Linux. Um, why? Because it's free. Yeah. Um, on day one, you don't know if you're going to have, and we don't know, didn't know as a startup, if we were having um, commercial success, if we were going to have many customers. So we went with consumption plan. We're now on a premium plan um, for multiple reasons. But on a consumption plan, yeah, sure, you're going to have cold start issues maybe um, that you can work around. But really, in the beginning, who cares? Your customers know you're an early startup, but who cares? Now we have over 120 functions across two app service plans, um, pretty much split into front and back end. Um, we should probably split that even more, but if we wanted to, that's an easy code change um, again because we are using this pass or FAS functions as a service um, platform to do all of this. We don't have to deploy more, more virtual machines. All of this happens automatically. And as I mentioned, logging and telemetry all happens via application insights just through configuration. And speaking of the automation, we use Pulumi um, infrastructure as code to deploy all our infrastructure. And to deploy this function app, this is all we had to do. A couple of lines of code, uh, and you can do the same in Bicep or ARM templates, obviously. Um, but we use uh, Pulumi here to configure what we want to see. We use system assigned identities um, further to the middle. Um, you can see system assigned as a managed identity. So we don't have to uh, configure any passwords. We don't have to hard code any credentials anywhere. This is all taken care of by the platform, by Azure. Um, so that if our function would have to go and get something out of a key vault or have to do something to our Cosmos DB backend, it would just know how to authenticate to that. So really simple for us to deploy this. Uh, and also, as a startup, sometimes back in the beginning, we also s screwed things up or things fell over and we just redeployed from scratch. And that was easy enough because we started with our, our infrastructure as code approach, everything automated, and that made it really easy. So why functions? Just a couple of points on why functions. Well, they automatically scale in all dimensions, up, down, and out, happened automatically. We didn't have to do anything for that, especially on the consumption plan. Um, there were a bit, few constraints, which is why we're now on the premium plan. Mostly that was uh, due to memory before we refactored and, and split up into multiple um, app service plans. but really now that we have quite a lot of customers on this, quite a lot of activity, we're now on the premium plan. But it also means we don't have to patch anything, no infrastructure. Yeah, you call it serverless, 
yes, they're a service, but we don't have to worry about them. It's Microsoft's responsibility to patch them. I don't care if it, our function is running in a container or it, if it's actually a Linux VM. Don't care. Um, it's probably a container. Um, but that's Microsoft's responsibility to make sure they're patched. If one dies, they come back. Yeah, we don't have to do that. Which means that all that is something which means we can focus on our code. We can focus on the thing that is going to make us money. One of the most important things was the easy, really easy integration with Cosmos DB, with our backend and other third-party services via native bindings. You can really simply say anything this function does and spits out in the end, just chuck it into our Cosmos DB. There's a connection string configured somewhere, and it just knows whatever it returns gets put into Cosmos DB. So focus on our own business code. We didn't have need to have OS experts on the team, which also applies to why Cosmos DB. We didn't need to have a DBA, really, that knew how to deploy a SQL cluster or a SQL always on across multiple um, availability zones or regions um, with Quorum and all of that. No need for that. We just write our code, what really sets us apart from everybody else in the industry, and we make sure that that's good. We don't need to be good at deploying a virtual machine. Microsoft is good at that. Which also means that day zero and day N questions were really already answered by the platform. On day zero, scaling was already answered by the platform. We didn't have to do that. Potentially, we just have to put some limits uh, and constraints into the platform so it doesn't scale indefinitely um, or into infinity um, and costs us eventually quite a lot of money. But really, we didn't have to figure out how to do things. Functions also have an amazing local development experience, in my opinion. So onboarding of new team members now happens pretty much in under an hour. And the big one was also on the consumption plan, you get a monthly free grant of 1 million requests on your function and 400,000 gigabyte seconds of resource consumption per subscription. That's quite a lot, um, although we already blew past that by far. But initially, that's, that's important. That's money you don't have to spend. So we have the Cosmos DB conference here. Let's talk about Cosmos DB, our backend. Similarly to the functions argument, why uh, did we use Cosmos DB? Because it does come with a free tier, by the way. You can get one Cosmos DB, DB account in your subscription with 1,000 request unit uh, per second and 25 gigabyte storage for free each month. That can already get you quite far, depending on how you build your application, how your queries run, how well you do your queries. That's going to get important in a second. You, you can already get quite far with a 1,000 request units per second. Don't have to go too deep into request units per second, but um, it really depends on how you also build your queries. Um, Microsoft charges you based on the compute, basically. They have to set aside for you to run a query and return the results. Well, very quickly, we, we got stung with $600 um, on that Cosmos DB backend, which ended up being the most expensive, but also the most valuable aspect of our application, really, um, before we started optimizing our spend here. We mentioned functions are really easy to use with Cosmos DB, and it's the same here. It, it, it was so easy, so much code we didn't have to write, so much time we didn't have to spend figuring things out. No patching required for Cosmos. Yeah, it's all taken care of by Microsoft. Database as a service, Microsoft patches the database, the underlying infrastructure, 
we don't have to do that. We don't have to figure out how to do the patching. There is no message to customers, excuse me, Argos is going to be down for the next hour because we're patching our database. None of that's required. Same with high availability, pretty much comes for free, depending on how you define high availability. Our data is replicated four times just in one region. And just a very quick new uh, news item, basically. Um, a few days ago, um, Cosmos DB actually announced that auto scaling can now happen from a 100 to 1,000 request units instead of 400 to 4,000 request units. You can actually save quite a bit of money with that on, uh, on database containers that aren't very active. To show you how we deploy it and how easy it is for us to really make changes also here, um, as an example, um, we only deploy into a single region our database um, for now, even though we have multiple databases, but for now, um, for compliance reasons, but for now, we only deploy each database account into a single region. If we wanted to deploy it into multiple, because it's pass, we just tell the service here in the geolocations, uh, list done here um, towards the end. We add another location, another region, and that's it. We push the code and Microsoft figures out how to do it. We don't have to figure that out. The scaling was really important to us, similar to the um, aspect around the functions, that this is all taken care of by Microsoft. You, probably see the pattern we pushed to make sure that all of the issues that we might see as a startup, that we don't have to deal with them, we push that to Microsoft. Scaling, patching, all this ops stuff, we push it over to Microsoft because they're really good at it. So scaling on the database be, happens based on demand. And we can define um, certain limits on both sides where we want scaling to happen, and Microsoft just figures it out. Uh, if we know there's very static, very constant um, um, usage on certain containers or database containers, then um, we can also define that, and we can define that in code as well. Right now, we have roughly around 17 million requests every month. Um, and because we use this pass service, Cosmos DB, or it's actually, even without us doing anything, you go to a so monitor and you get this nice picture here on where you can see all these metrics, the data usage, how many requests on each account and database and collection, um, how many documents you have, which is why I can tell you we have over 3.3 million documents in our databases. Uh, which roughly equates to probably 3.28 million cloud resources under management and 17 million requests. This is, we uh, changed the filter to scale, uh, sorry, to month. Um, so 17, roughly 17 million requests every month on this database. And we didn't have to change anything from when we had only 100 requests against this database to now 17 million requests. And we're not expecting to have to change really anything for when we have 10 times as much because Microsoft takes care of that. We just sell, sell, sell the product, make sure customers are secure in their cloud, that they are taken care of. We build a really good product but scaling is not a tech issue for us. So a couple of tips and tricks um, before we probably have to wrap up at some point. Um, free tier was really appealing to us and it should be to you as well, especially if you're a startup, especially, and startup in this case, by the way, lots of people glaze over when I say startup because they're working at this big bank or big enterprise or whatever. They're 
are startups inside of enterprises, inside of banks. If you're a team, you're building something new, you're a startup, period. Convince me otherwise. <laughs> um, we knew that our data will be very random. That's why we used Cosmos DB. We didn't want to spend so much time figuring out what our database schema was going to be um, to build a SQL database, really, um, knowing that the data schema is probably going to change in a month, in two months, again. And we would have to do the whole exercise again and again and again. So having a non-relational database like Cosmos DB was actually really helpful. We could just chuck the data into our database and just query it back um, via code. Um, and it didn't care about a schema. Super powerful for us because all the data we get from Microsoft, from Amazon, from Google, all these um, uh, schema or these resource configurations basically are all very, very different. And we couldn't properly predict them. So having a pretty much chuck it in that database like Cosmos was really powerful. Speaking of querying it back, support for SQL API meant that all our .NET developers were super at home. Uh, it, just really easy adoption. Really fast read actions was important to us because we query our database a lot. All our scans that we do against our database because we scan pretty much in real time. We scan continuously our customer, data, uh, customer environments. We needed to read so many times. And Cosmos is just great for that. However, on the flip side, our queries initially were really bad and expensive. Some of these um, queries consumed way over 5,000 request units. And initially, we didn't fully understand why. Um, we were constantly seeing 429 throttling errors, yeah? um, where Cosmos DB said, well, you don't have enough request units available. So, and because we also went, oh, maybe we shouldn't scale beyond this number of request units because it would be too uh, expensive. We were constantly hitting these HTTP um, 429 errors. As it turned out, the C Sharp SDK that could help us build these um, Cosmos DB queries was really helpful, but it can also hide bad queries, hide in quotes, um, because without going into, because that could um, easily uh, waste a, a, a week of workshop uh, into query design, um, really how you query, how you filter can make a massive difference in Cosmos DB. So we um, luckily sent all our Cosmos DB metrics into um, application insights, log analytics actually, um, and we could just use this query here that you can see, and that's actually straight from the documentation. Um, so don't worry about copying this, but feel free to take a screenshot. Um, take this query here and actually see which queries were consuming which or how many request charges. One gotcha though. On the right, the column, you can see request charge underscore s. It seems like request charge is actually a string, not an integer. So when in the documentation, and I do need to um, probably report that in the documentation, it says order by the string. It doesn't properly order by the number of the request charges. As you can see, um, nine is not greater than 89.89. .89. However, once you once you know that, once you've seen that, you can do your own um, sorting and filtering. Or you can export it to Excel and all of that, and do your own thing. Um, but it then tells you, well, this is the query. Maybe you shouldn't be doing it this way. Maybe you should be doing it that way, um, or maybe we need to change our C sharp code to do it properly. It's super helpful. 
saved us a ton of money to, in the end, use these diagnostic metrics to really give us more insights. It also turned out we over-indexed our documents. We really didn't have to index everything that we almost never or rarely queried on. Um, Azure support was really helpful figuring out these things with us. Um, they actually helped us see, uh, reduce our costs so much. Um, they, they saved us a lot of money. So they were worth their uh, time and gold, pretty much, um, uh, while improving our application's performance. Yeah, we, we worked with them, um, had a few workshops with them um, via tickets and the startup team, and they made our application better and cheaper, which was just amazing. Um, highly recommend. And that's how we ended up building um, an application that can now help our customers find and really investigate, automatically investigate security issues on their behalf. No human needs to go and build a diagram like this. This is all done using Cosmos DB and the functions in front of that to really build this real-time diagram and paths. Yeah, you can see the red graphs and on the other side, on the right side, how somebody could potentially laterally move through your environment. And this is all powered by Cosmos DB and Azure Functions. And with that, um, I want to say thank you very much for having me. I think I'm up to time. Um, if you're interested in this, have a look on what it means. There's a free, absolutely free, we don't even ask for a credit card, free trial um, to for you to take a look. Um, but hit me up with any questions on Twitter, on email, whatever you want to use, or if you have any. And thank you very much for spending the last, I think, 25 minutes with me. Thank you. Yeah, that was an awesome session with lots of uh, do do's and don'ts, right, on architecture and also especially on the Cosmos TV side. Uh, we have a few questions from the audience that we want to take them up. Uh, you mentioned about using uh, Pulumi, right, for the uh, infrastructure as code. Uh, why didn't you choose some of the other uh, tools such as Terraform or even Azure DevOps? Uh, so we use uh, GitHub Actions to deploy because um, yeah. it's free. We didn't have to pay anything for it. Um, and we use we don't use Terraform. We use Pulumi because um, our application is our front end is written in types uh, sorry in Angular, TypeScript, uh, and we can define our infrastructure also in TypeScript using Pulumi. Um, so our developers, our engineers, don't have to learn yet another language. Terraform is a completely different language that only applies to Terraform and nothing else. Pulumi's languages apply to everything else. Thanks, David. No Makes sense. Uh, there's another question, David. Um, uh, 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 one of the uh, you know comments is that uh, uh, the person is heading a bootstrapped startup as well, and he has decided to make usage of Azure Functions with Cosmos DB. But his question is mainly on the Azure Function, uh, using Azure Function in real life scenarios, replacing a web API, especially the problem of cold starts. Uh, so did he face, did you face any such issue and um, how did you get past that? Yes, we absolutely did in the beginning, um, which was um, absolutely expected and accepted um, because mm -hmm. we were on the consumption plan. It's a free plan. You get cold start issues if your application isn't running all the time. Um, we absolutely accepted that. We communicated that to our customers that that might happen, that they might have to click a button again for something to happen. They were fine mm -hmm. with that because they knew we were a startup. Um, now we're on the premium plan where we don't have these issues anymore. All right. I think we have a couple of more questions, so I will merge them together. So you spoke about being vendor locked. And personally, I have seen that you know startups uh, they usually uh, don't stick one vendor. And it was very good to hear that you have uh, stick with Azure. What are the top three things that, uh, you know, uh, that made you to stick with Azure? And uh, I'm sure security is one of them. And uh, a couple of questions that to add on, right? And how security is handled in case of Cosmos DB? And how do you handle the uh, sensitive information 
uh, and also have you implemented a caching strategy to uh, lower the cost in terms of the queries that you're making? Cool. Um, so uh, lock-in, if you're a startup and you're, fo you're worried about lock-in, you're worried about the wrong thing. Yeah, you should be focused on building your product and building your application, um, not about how can I potentially move it over to a different cloud provider or whatever. You're worrying about the wrong thing. Um, two, we're not using any caching at this point. Um, our data also changes way too often for caching to make a lot of sense. Um, uh, security, we use Defender for Cosmos DB. Woohoo! New service, uh, new feature available in preview. Um, go enable it on your um, uh, Cosmos DB accounts. Um, that does um, uh, protect our Cosmos DB account uh, quite well. We haven't seen any uh, alerts come out of it yet. Fingers crossed. Touch wood. All good. Um, and uh, I do have a blog article on that on my blog as well um, uh, that explains how to actually enable it, but it only takes 30 seconds. Um, and at the moment, I think it's free. All right. Thanks, David. I think uh, those are the questions that we had from the audience. And thanks for the awesome presentation. Uh, I hear from customers on a daily basis, you know, the managing the infrastructure, especially at uh, scale can be hard. Uh, you must follow the best practices, use automation infrastructure as a code to do the things right. Uh, especially when you do startup and as a startup founder, you must always ready for that unpredictable surge in traffic uh, that you mentioned in your session. I think you have covered most aspects of it. Swita, what did you get out of this session? Um, no, what I really appreciate, Saji, is the clarity, David, that you had that, uh, hey, I don't want to build what's already available. I just want to make the best use of um, uh, all the, um, you know, uh, past services and everything that's available on Azure to build my service quickly. So that clarity of thought is exactly what uh, we build the platform for. So um, uh, that's awesome, David. Thanks so much for your time again. And I'm sure... Uh, all other startup founders, as well as anybody who is trying to build uh, a new service or trying to scale it, will benefit from your insights today. So that's really great. Thanks. Awesome. Again. Thank you. Thank you, David. So, Saji, our next session is by Sindhu Chandran, and she's going to talk about migrating Apache Flink data pipelines to write to Azure Cosmos DB Cassandra API. Okay, I think she's going to talk us through the changes needed and the best practices that she learned during the migration to Azure Cosmos DB Cassandra API. Uh, to introduce her, uh, Sindhu is a data science and engineering manager at IBM. Uh, her job involves helping other people realize the value from data and I'm super, uh, super excited to learn more about her migration story to Cosmos DB Cassandra API. Over to you, Sindhu. Uh, hi everyone, thank you for having me here today. Uh, so on myself, I'm Sindhu. I work with IBM Consulting. I work with customers mostly on data engineering, uh, and I also dabble in data science for fun. Uh, and today I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, some uh, experience that I recently had migrating Apache Flink pipelines, uh, which were using Cassandra on-premise on uh, to Cosmos DB Cassandra API. Uh, so to give some context to uh, what I'm going to talk about, uh, this is a fictitious company called Kirana Q. Uh, Kirana stands for your neighborhood store, community store. And uh, uh, this is also, again, a customer 360 kind of uh, uh, use case where they get data from multiple data sources, uh, internal and external sources, batch and streaming data sources. And... Uh, they have a need to make it available to their digital channels uh, to provide an enhanced customer experience. And now Kirana Cube is on their journey to cloud, uh, where they are invested in Azure Cloud, and they would like to continue using their uh, technology stack, uh, which they have considerable uh, you know, investment on already, which is based on Apache Flink, Kafka, and Cassandra. Uh, so this, uh, they, they expect this to continue uh, providing the same throughput and latency that they currently enjoy on their on-prem uh, on uh, setup. 
So this is where the, this is the con this is where the context is. And I will be talking mostly from a developer perspective as to what we need to be aware when we move from uh, Apache, Apache Cassandra on-prem to Cosmos DB Cassandra API. So uh, as you're probably aware, Cosmos DB is uh, available in these different flavors. And uh, one good thing for uh, a K2 or Kirana Cube is that they can continue using their uh, Cassandra investment uh, with hopefully minimal changes. Uh, so uh, the great thing is that it is via protocol compatible with Apache Cassandra. It is available as a fully managed uh, platform as a service. So this means that they no, no longer need to manage the nodes, clusters, what they were doing currently on-prem. So this saves considerable amount of uh, time and money. And the third uh, important uh, advantage is that they can continue to use the uh, client drivers and uh, the familiar CQL that they were using on-prem. Uh, so this is the kind of setup that they are moving to where uh, they will continue to use their Flink and Kafka uh, uh, based uh, data pipelines hosted on Azure Kubernetes service and writing to Apache Cassandra provided on Cosmos DB. From there, the online application will uh, read uh, this data based on the requirements of the digital channels that uh, this empowers. So this is my uh, uh, 10 point uh, list of uh, some of the things that uh, I have learned during this journey. So, uh, so uh, 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 this is like mostly from a developer perspective, but covers some part of the architectural uh, concepts that we need to be aware of when moving from uh, Cassandra to Cosmos DB. So the first one is to know your DB, then you get going with tools. Uh, then the next third step is about understanding the connector APIs and SSL setup needed. Uh, and very important, the dealing with request units for capacity. And then making use of insights uh, to understand what is really happening there. Optimization and error handling. And then making use of partitioning well. Managing consistency, availability. And finally, planning your data migration from on-prem to uh, Azure Cosmos DB. So the first uh, important uh, item that you need to be aware of is the resource model. So this is the mapping to Cassandra for your Azure Cosmos DB. So you have this database account or the Azure Cosmos DB account created uh, based on the flavor of Cosmos DB that you are using. So this, so you create this for Cassandra. And the database here that you create maps to the Cassandra key space. And within the database, you can add multiple containers. And container is the term which maps to Cassandra table. And the items here map to Cassandra rows. So this is uh, the first important part to understand. Uh, and the next, uh, uh, the next thing to understand is about what is supported and what is different. Uh, because uh, you might spend a lot of time otherwise uh, you know, uh, finding issues or uh, trying to debug uh, things which you think might work, but it is actually not supported. Uh, so they, and there are also a lot of advantages which come with Cosmos DB in terms of the increased replication that it provides and things like that. So it is very important that we first review what is supported and different so that we are not wasting time, uh, you, you know, later deciding that what is not supported will not work. We cannot live with what is not supported or being making sure that we know of the advantages that Cosmos DB provides. So these are the first two steps that I would start with to know your uh, DB or know your Cassandra DB on Cosmos. Uh, and the next uh, step would be to get going with the tooling. Uh, and here again, uh, when, we, when you were on-prem, uh, Probably the CQL just came along and you might not have really bothered setting this up. And currently the Azure portal uh, does not really provide the complete 
CQL uh, tooling on Portal. So it is very important that you have uh, followed the instructions and the versions which is supported for CQL and set this up on whichever OS where you want to work with. And make sure that you uh, use the uh, SSL settings as applicable and make uh, you know use the SSL parameter while connecting. So this would be the second step to start with to get your tooling set up uh, for Cassandra. Okay, and this is where uh, I think as a developer, you would probably spend uh, some time on uh, because there are some differences here that might be needed, uh, some uh, changes which might be needed to your code to make sure things work seamlessly. And, uh, but very nicely, uh, when uh, we have a lot of examples available here already, so the first thing to start with that uh, I would do is uh, take one of the uh, sample uh, applications which are provided to validate your connectivity in the Azure environment. So you could use the Java, .NET, Python, or Golang packages. And uh, in my uh, story, K2 or Kirana Cube decides to go with Java v3. So this is the one that you download and you can try to uh, you know, connect using this sample application uh, to confirm everything is good on your Azure environment. So that is the first step. Uh, and as I said, there are these multiple options that Datastax Java drivers have in terms of v3 versus v4. And uh, Apache Flink, again, supports multiple programming languages. So it supports Java, Scala, Python, and SQL. And in the case of Kirana Cube, they were primarily on a Java stack. And it, they already use this particular uh, Cassandra sync or a connector that comes with Apache Flink called Flink Connector Cassandra. So it is very important to be aware that this internally uses the Datastax version 3 API. So when we use uh, uh, anything related to Cassandra, it is better to stick to the same. Uh, if, you are, if you are going to use the Cassandra sync, that is one option, then you would uh, rather use the same uh, compatible Java drivers, the version three of the Java drivers. And in case you want to uh, go for Java version four, you could implement a custom uh, connector. So this is also a good option uh, in case your code base is in Scala or uh, you want to use the version four for uh, some uh, advantages, then you could create a custom Cassandra connector with the version four API. Uh, and uh, Azure provides uh, some additional extensions uh, for Cosmos DB uh, a connection handling and retry logic, which is available in both the version three and version four APIs. Uh, the, uh, uh, the last thing to know uh, in terms of code changes is related to the SSL connectivity. So you might not have been using this on-prem uh, if you were, uh, you know, in a uh, internal environment, and so this is uh, something that has to be done when we uh, move to Azure. So uh, you could use uh, just the with SSL without a key store, and it would just pick up the default Java Trust store, which would do for dev environments. But otherwise, you uh, can use either the SSL options with Java V3 API or the SSL context uh, with the version 4 API. Uh, so these are the options for SSL that has to be set up while connecting to Cassandra. So this sort of summarizes the key changes that are needed uh, for uh, from a code point of view for your application to work. Uh, the next important lesson is about dealing with request units or RUs for capacity. Uh, so a request unit uh, is defined similarly across all, uh, API, all APIs supported by Cosmos. So it is the cost of the database operations expressed uh, as a performance currency. So it abstracts the usage of these different CPU, IOPS, and memory. And uh, you have to be aware that there are these different modes of uh, setting up this which are available. So if you do not really want to be dealing with RUs, then you could use the serverless option, but uh, you pay based on usage. Uh, you don't need to manage RUs here, uh, but then there are some limitations uh, in terms of the size of data 
and also the geo redundancy options which are available. Uh, the next option is the provision throughput or manually managing your RUs. This can be done at the container or key space level or at the database or uh, the table level. So when you do it at the key space level, it, is, it works for uh, smaller tables and there is a limitation of 25 tables uh, and you might not have visibility into uh, hot uh, tables which are causing hot partitions when you do that. Uh, the database level, uh, the table level gives more flexibility in managing your RUs. The provision throughput is a good option if your workloads are uh, predictable with maybe some 20 to 25 percent variation. And the other option is the auto scale, uh, which again you can set at a container or database level. So uh, where uh, you pay one and a half times the cost for of the provision throughput. Uh, but then there is the option to uh, scale between a range that, that is set. Uh, so one option would be to start with auto scale uh, to avoid any uh, limitations of lesser RUs. And then uh, based on your usage, you could provision throughput uh, to uh, you know, better manage your cost. And uh, this is one of my favorite parts of moving to uh, Cosmos DB Cassandra API. So there is this uh, beautiful drill down analysis of all the database operations. Uh, so you could go and you know check uh, with time range at a table level. You could get throughput requests, partitioning details. So a lot of insights which are available, which you can further customize as well if you want uh, specific metrics. So this is like a very useful feature that is a must uh, to leverage when we move to Cosmos DB Cassandra. Uh, and this is again very important to know. So one of the first things that you face when you probably move is the rate limiting uh, issues. So in the case of Kirana Q, uh, the jobs were failing because of uh, lesser RUs. Uh, and uh, you don't really want your jobs failing because of it. So you, might, you, could, you could just, in, so there are two options. You could increase the RUs based on the latency expectations. And even if the RUs per second becomes a little less than what is provisioned, you really do not want your job to fail. So uh, it is advised that you implement the Cosmos retry policy, which is a custom version of the Cassandra retry policy. So this is available on the, as an open source uh, GitHub project. So there is a Cosmos retry policy that is uh, good to use to avoid these rate limiting errors. Um, and this is again a must do to implement the reconnection policy. And the, uh, Cassandra supports uh, uh, some two or three reconnection policies. The one that is recommended for uh, Azure Cosmos DB is uh, the constant reconnection policy with around 2000 milliseconds. So this is the option. Uh, and this is sort of a must have because we found that without this, uh, your jobs are likely to have connection issues. And so as I said, there is this Azure Cosmos Cassandra extensions for Java, which has uh, these additional uh, uh, um, additional uh, settings and tuned settings which you can use, like the Cosmos retry policy. So this is also a good tool to use uh, to better manage your connectivity settings. And finally, uh, what we learned is that you get charged the same if your record is 0.1 KB or 1 KB. Uh, so it helps to sort of have a data model which is suitable to that and uh, important to analyze the read, write and query volumes so that we can uh, manage the throughput, provision RUs, elastically scale, do all of those. Uh, and uh, coming to partitioning, uh, so uh, if you ha have been on Cassandra, you must be already using the Cassandra partitioning uh, for improved queries. So uh, on Azure, there is a concept of a physical partition, which is the equivalent of your VM or compute unit. And it can uh, have up to 10,000 RUs. Uh, there are four replicas of the partition uh, created. Uh, so 
uh, be aware that uh, if you need more than one partition allocated, then you need to set your RUs to more than 10,000. So especially if you are having uh, Flink-like parallel distributed programs, where you want to be writing in parallel or you want to be uh, loading data uh, maybe uh, quickly or with a higher latency, and you might want to be aware that you need to provision more than 10,000 RUs if you need uh, to have more than one partition. And the logical partition is the equivalent of the Cassandra partition. And uh, the insights lets you monitor uh, hot, hot partitions. Uh, for example, uh, if I had a, a table which is based on uh, location, which had a partition based, a column based on location, and let us say 80% uh, of the customers happen to be from Mumbai, uh, then uh, it would cause you know, a hot partition, and that might not be the ideal partition key to use. Uh, so, but it lets you, the insights lets you catch uh, these uh, issues as well. So this is about partitioning. And uh, again, uh, you need to be aware of how the consistency maps to a Cassandra consistency and the cost implications of the same. Uh, so if you, based on, so there are these, different options which are provided on Cosmos TV, and there is a mapping provided from how this kind of relates to the Cassandra level consistencies. So it is important to be aware of this uh, in choosing uh, your settings. And a plan, when, when it comes to availability, the node outages seem very well covered uh, because there is uh, uh, a guaranteed three replicas which are kept in each Azure region. So the node outages are covered that way. And to cover zone outages, there is an option to deploy across availability zones when you create the Cosmos TV account. And when you deploy more than one region, you can have a, a highly available application. And uh, you could be writing in one region. So this is the option that uh, Kirana Q opt, opts for which is like single write region. So you write to one region, but the read is available from more than one region. So this is a good option to provide uh, high availability and low latency. But in case you have a lot of write, which is needed from multiple regions, this is supported as well, though with some possibility of conflicts, which you have to manage. Uh, for each Azure region, there are four replicas of the data which are made available. So based on the uh, number of regions, there are so, so many more copies of the data which is going to be uh, kept for availability. Uh, finally, on data migration, uh, so you can continue to use the CQL SH copy command for smaller data sets. Uh, and as your, uh, the documentation recommends uh, Spark for larger data sets, but uh, since uh, K2 or Kirana Cube is a Flink shop, uh, we used uh, Flink instead, and this works well too. So this is on data migration. Uh, some references. So the Azure uh, documentation is extremely helpful, and the tech support uh, were very helpful in uh, helping us understand a lot of the changes and concepts what is supported and making uh, sense of the RU concept, which was particularly new when moving from Cassandra to Cosmos DB. Thank you uh, for having me here today. Thanks so much, uh, Sindhu. That was really great. Um, Tell us uh, about a couple of issues that you didn't have to bother about anymore after you migrated from Cosmos DB as compared to your earlier um, self-hosted setup. Uh, can you repeat that question? I think I missed a part of it. Uh, yeah, uh, my question, Sindhu, was um, can you tell us um, a few benefits that you saw after migrating to Cosmos DB so that, hey, Maybe this thing I didn't have to bother about anymore. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, so uh, yeah, one thing is of course that uh, I am not really uh, aware of all the twenty-five nodes 
uh, and the OS patching, uh, you know, that you get notified of every quarter. Uh, that So we don't really need to be aware of that. Uh, that's mm. number one. So uh, all of that happens uh, seamlessly behind the scenes. Uh, the second one is uh, the insights. Uh, so I think that's like very, very useful to have uh, that freely available for use uh, to monitor what has happened and, uh, uh, you know, to monitor the throughput uh uh, the latency and uh, partitions and all of that to optimize. Uh, so that's those are the two uh, things I think which I particularly uh, benefited from. Okay, awesome. adding to the question that Sweta asked, uh, you spoke about ten important things on the reasons on why you choose Cosmos DB Cassandra API. On the other side, we also have this uh, Cassandra managed instance offering as well, right? Uh, were you comparing those uh, two before making this decision uh, for this data pipeline use case? Uh, in this case, uh, not really. So this was not a decision which I made. So uh, it was uh, sort of, you know, part of the uh, uh, strategy that the other okay. organization had, yeah, so. All right, got it. Okay. So, um, and um, thanks for hitting on some of the important points um, about migration planning there. Uh, one of the things you mentioned was, you know, um, about the partition key selection and being wise with partitioning, right? Uh, so, what were your learnings around data modeling um, since you were migrating? I'm assuming. Um, you know, there might have been fewer changes, but did you have to tweak anything with the partition key selection? How did you go about that? Uh, so uh, not yet, I would say, though we are uh, kind of watching it. Uh, so we have a, a bit of a, a combination where uh, we do have like some workload on prem, but which isn't a whole lot. Uh, so we are also having a lot of new requirements where we are adding, uh, you know, uh, to our data model and uh, building for new requirements. So and currently it's like mostly for new requirements that we are going to be building. So we are, I would say, watching it closely. Uh, uh, so, yeah, that's where it is. OK, I think you spoke about, uh, OK, uh, yeah, I, uh, I think you spoke about uh, different scenarios where you have implemented the retry logic. Uh, you mentioned about a reconnection policy with, uh, you know, 2000 seconds or milliseconds, I would say. Uh, is it particular to your scenario or is there any recommended practice that you recommend others when they're doing this kind of migration? Uh, so uh, in this case, I, uh, this is something that I rec uh, followed based on the uh, documentation. Yeah. Uh, yeah, right. So because on prem, we did not really use this particular uh, parameter. Okay. So that was definitely a change. Uh, but uh, this is the recommended setting. So there are some three, two or three connection reconnection policies that are provided by Cassandra, but this was particularly recommended uh, in the documentation. All right. I think you answered most of uh, all the questions we had. Uh, thank you, Sindhu, uh, Sindhu, for sharing your insights, especially around one of the hottest topics these days uh, for customers. Uh, yeah, we usually hear from customers that migrations can be uh, sometimes tricky because you have to make sure that uh, business uh, continuity is always there and the whole solution works in the expected manner. Uh, Sweta, I think uh, Sindhu mentioned about some of the things that uh, you know, beginners need to consider when they are starting with some of the past services, especially on Cosmos DB. What you, what's your thoughts? Right, right, Saji. So yeah, um, like we hear often, right? Uh, when you're new to Cosmos DB, there are certain concepts that you might need to wrap your head around before you know your life becomes much easier, right? Because it's a scalable past service, unlike your self-hosted instances. So uh, things like partitioning, data modeling, the insights, all of that um, Sindhu has covered today. Thanks again, Sindhu, uh, for sharing your experience um, and your pain points and insights on how you got past those challenges and leveraged uh, Cosmos DB Cassandra API. So thanks so much again. It was great to have you here. Thank you. Thanks. 
Speaking of uh, the concepts that new developers need to keep in mind, uh, Saji, one of the areas that, as we know, developers who are new to Cosmos DB need to understand is how to model that data to make it scale, right? And many a times users will approach Cosmos DB and they apply relational concepts of data modeling that they are familiar with. And this nearly always results in a database that does not scale. Uh, as a horizontally partitioned NoSQL database, Cosmos DB requires unique knowledge and different techniques that allows for data to be managed efficiently and at scale. So let's take a look at this quick video that gives us a two minute view on some of these key concepts that you need to consider when modeling data for Cosmos DB. Azure Cosmos DB enables incredible speeds, provided you choose the data model that best supports how you use your application. Data modeling is the process by which you establish patterns and rules for storing data across documents and containers, determining how data is accessed. Choosing the right data model for your workload results in better performance and faster speeds, especially as your database grows. While there are many nuances to data modeling, every project starts with the same question whether to embed or reference. Embedding, also known as denormalizing, allows you to combine related entities into a single document. When used with read-heavy applications, results come in fast and ready to serve, no joins required. Embedding often leads to data duplication. With Azure Cosmos DB, duplications aren't a problem. The Azure Cosmos DB change feed helps maintain referential integrity across containers. Embedding falls short, however, when there's no practical limit to how much data will be stored and you reach the maximum size for a single document. It's also not ideal for write-heavy applications because it can lead to bottlenecked requests. In those cases, it's better to use referencing or normalizing like you would for a relational database. By creating unique entities that reference one another, you can break up write requests and break down large documents to speed up your application. Enable top speeds and seamless experiences at any scale with Azure Cosmos DB by implementing the right data model for your application from the start. Welcome back everyone. That's a must watch video uh, about one of the critical concepts on Cosmos DB, right? Uh, all right, Sweta, let's move on to our next session. It's on the topic, uh, real-time cosmic chat, presented by Divaka Kumar. Uh, Divaka is a senior software engineering engineer at H&M, and he will uh, show us a cool demo on how to build a uh, cosmic chat application in real-time using Azure Cosmos DB and Azure Functions, and also use the Azure Web Sub. Uh, that's one of my favorite topic as well. Uh, let's hear from Divaka. Over to you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me here. So uh, welcome to my session. So today we are going to see how to build a real-time Cosmic Chat application using Azure Cosmos DB. So myself, Divaka Kumar, I work as a senior software engineer at h &M. So our entire session is going to be based on an application that I have developed uh, known as Cosmos Path. So it is not only the chat application. Uh, there are other Azure components uh, integrated within this and how the Cosmos DBs are interlinked within these components that we are going to see uh, in the next few minutes. So the main objective uh, of this session is going to be like, uh, I have a lot of learnings while building this Cosmos Park application. So I'm going to share those learnings with you as well. And uh, I just want to make sure like you understand the data flow between these uh, different Azure components within this uh, application and uh, some of the few examples when it com comes to the design considerations. So when, when you want to choose the right partition key and how you can make use of the change field uh, in order to do that. And the third part is like uh, the most interesting part because at the end of the day, like we need to show something in the uh, front end, right? So, so we are gonna see uh, about the web sockets and how it can be interlinked within the Azure Cosmos DB. And at the end, like we are going to see a real demo on this one. So to start with, um, so we are going to see the change feed. So this is going to be our real hero of this application. So if you are new to this Cosmos DB, change feed is nothing but a list of persistent records. 
uh, that keeps on listening to a particular Azure Cosmos container. So whenever there is an update uh, happening in your uh, documents, it keeps on listening to that and it lists a sort of, um, uh, it sorts those documents in the order that they were modified. So, so by this, like you will be guaranteed uh, on the order that they are modified only within a particular partition key. So what I mean by that is, say suppose um, uh, like you, you are uh, querying on different partition keys or if you are um, um, uh, having a different partition key uh, which is not suitable for the order delivery, uh, consider this example like um, a retail industry, right? So you are adding an item A to a shopping cart and um, adding an item B to a shopping cart and then you are removing an item from the shopping cart A and now you are checking out the uh, items. So this, this should be in the order because like at the checkout, you don't need to have the item A in your checkout, right? So in order to do that, you need to define your partition key in a uh, well way. So um, what I mean by the partition key is, it is just a key uh, for your uh, document uh, to, to uniquely represents your document. Um, so that you will be logically differentiating um, um, a particular set of records within your container. And internally what happens is these list of records to a particular partition key will be stored in different uh, physical servers. So that makes it easier for you to query a particular document uh, when, when you are pointing to that partition key. So make sure that you are um, choosing this partition key wise. Um, when, when it comes to the ordered uh, delivery as well, because the change feed works in a way um, um, with this partition key only, and you will be getting uh, this in order only if you choose the right partition key. So as when I started working on this application, there were few questions that came up. So how to listen for a create or delete events, because the capability of this change feed um, is to listen uh, for the any modifications with respect to the documentation, but it doesn't listen to any delete events that you are having within the documentation. So how to how to do this? So the, the one way of doing this is to soft update or soft delete. So by this way, like um, you can have a flag internally within your document, like say suppose like is update or is create or is delete. So uh, you can point it to either true or false so that you will be knowing or you will be able to differentiate between a create and an update operation. And as well, you will be able to make sure that this is going to be a delete operation and you can perform your uh, business use case uh, further on. And if you are worried uh, about the documents being stored um, even after the delete operation, because now we are following a, di a different approach, having the soft key uh, to, to make sure that change fees are listening to these events. So you can use uh, the time to live property, which, which will make that particular document to be expired after that specific uh, period of time. So this is one way of going about uh, the uh, differentiating your operations, either it is going to be a create or update, because this would be the common scenario which everyone might be ending up with, because um, uh, if you are uh, already using uh, the change feed, you might be knowing this, like um, you, you won't be able to differentiate between the create or update operation and as well the delete operation. So this would be the right way to do, go about it. And there are different uh, common scenarios where you can think uh, change fit would be a better fit. So consider uh, there are different data uh, that is going to flow into this Cosmos DB, uh, which you uh, have as your as your persistence layer, and uh, your change fit is going to listen on to these uh, um, uh, data or modifications of the document. So once you are listening to these events, so one way of thinking about this is like you can trigger an uh, API at the um, um, uh, the, the, the downstream. So you can either have it, have your APIs in the, your Azure functions or uh, your app service, or you can even trigger a notification through the Azure notifications apps. You can th think of a scenario in that way, or you can even think of a real time processing scenario where you are using these real data uh, for the stream analytics purpose, or else you can even think of it way of like having this solution, this use case, uh, for the migration scenarios as well. Like if in case like you want to replicate your data to a different storage, or if you want to have a same copy of data into a, a different container, you can think of a change feed as a use case for your um, business use case as well. And as when I started architecting this solution, so I 
um, end up in um, uh, this question. So can we have multiple listeners on the same Azure Cosmos container? Uh, because this would be the common scenario in the real world, because uh, if you consider a single event, uh, there might be multiple business use cases based on that. So in our application, consider um, there is going to be an user created event. So I can trigger a mail to that particular uh, user or else I can um, update the specific address or location of them in the um, Azure maps that we are going to see in the demo. And also I'm going to push a notifications into the, um, uh, the, the web sockets. So these are different events that you can consider for a single event, right? So in these many uh, cases, like you might end up in having multiple listeners on the same uh, uh, Cosmos container. So is this possible? Yes, this is possible. Um, the way to do that is using the leases. So the leases is nothing but the concept of the documents um, which uh, has the checkpoints uh, for your Azure functions to work. So consider um, this is going to be your uh, Cosmos DB change page. And um, there are going to be different Azure functions uh, that are going to listen on to these uh, change feeds uh, triggers. Okay. So um, whenever um, uh, a particular Azure function is uh, failing or shut downing for some reasons, so the, the leases is going to contain a checkpoint which allows you to go back um, at, the, at the exact same place, like once it uh, restarted the Azure container. So you can either create, you, you, you have two options to go about this. So you can either create one lease per container for per functions, or you can have a shared leases container. So in the, in the first case, there is a trade off, like, because now you need to uh, incur additional costs because the leases is also gonna be a new container and you need to uh, provision uh, throughput or uh, uh, for, for those containers as well. Or else you can have a single lease container that can be shared across multiple Azure functions, which can be handled for different use cases. So this is one way of going uh, about this, and this is the best practice. Uh, but there is a trade-off uh, that you can um, think of in future uh, in this shared leases container as well, because consider a scenario where you end up adding more and more subscribers to this particular change event. So you might reach this situation where you need to increase the throughput average consumption. That again also gonna consume you some amount like where you need to reconsider on increasing the throughput for the particular container. So the other alternative for going about this is using the event grid solution. So the event grid solution is the publisher subscriber model. So there can be many event sources. It just publishes this event to the event grid and um, there can be many subscribers that you can ha have as an event handlers. So the publisher doesn't know, uh, it doesn't wants to know like what the subscriber is going to handle uh, in the later stage of the time. So in our case, you can have one Azure functions that is going to be a Cosmos DB trigger for listening to those change feeds. And you can publish these events to the event grid. So now what happens is, uh, you can add as many subscribers as you want in the future as well, and you are not going to incur any additional cost with respect to the container. So this is one way of going about this, and that that is how I have modeled my application as well. And the next part is like uh, the the next question that I had is uh, how to publish the real time events to be printed. So whatever we have seen till now is. Um, good like um, whenever there is some change in the database we are able to capture it in our uh, backend system but how to get it all the way out to the front end so in our application so our front end is based out of the uh, plain javascript and html uh, page so how to go about this one so the one way of going about this is using the web sockets protocol so now we need to think of a different protocol other than the http because uh, if, if you are using HTTP protocol, you need to use a long polling mechanism where you will be pinging uh, for a uh, quiet period of time to the server, like whether the data has been reached or whether the data has been changed. Uh, so one, only then like you will be receiving those real-time events in, in your application. But WebSocket is a different concept or a different protocol on its own where you will be opening uh, two-way communication between your server and the client which makes it easier for you to publish the real time events, uh, which gets uh, delivered in a real real time, near real time.
to the print time. So one way of uh, using this, uh, using the uh, Azure services is um, I have used the Azure Web Hub subservice. So this is uh, this allows you to uh, uh, handle this WebSocket uh, connection between your client and the servers. So as uh, as it is shown in the diagram, so there can be number of clients um, uh, to whom you can broadcast the message to, and from the clients also you can directly communicate with the uh, Azure Web Hub subservice without going uh, through a round trip to a server, different servers. That is also possible. So we uh, consider both of these scenarios in our application, which we will see in a bit. So uh, the, the way to do that is using the sub protocol that you could see here. Uh, it is json.webhubsub.azure.v1. This is um, a sub protocol that you need to uh, mention whenever you are initializing this WebSocket within your JavaScript. So uh, you, you, uh, if you have done this step, so now you will be able to interact with this webhub subservice directly from the client without uh, having an intermediate server in, in the middle. So now comes to the architecture of our Cosmos Spark application. So, so this is going to be our device skyline. So consider this is going to be any browser or any user. So they are going to be uh, reaching to our uh, uh, plain JavaScript HTML application that is hosted in the Azure Static Web App. So it is on a hosting platform uh, where you can post the uh, front end and as well the back end as well. And uh, you will get a lot of uh, other features with, um, which I'm not going to cover in the session because it is a different session on its own. So uh, from this um, uh, front end application, we are going to call uh, uh, REST APIs. So um, we have defined a REST APIs in the Azure functions as an HTTP trigger. So because our entire application is built out of a serverless mode, uh, event-driven architecture. So that is why the all of these uh, HTTP calls goes to, into the Azure functions. And from the Azure functions, we are persisting the data into the Azure Cosmos DB. So this is where the uh, vital role takes place or kicks in. So now the different events uh, will be fanned out to different subscribers. So from the Cosmos DB, uh, the, uh, the one way of uh, listening to these events is using the Cosmos DB trigger. Or the other way is using the uh, change feed processing library. But the uh, efficient or an easier way to use it is using the Azure function. Internally, this is also using the change feed processing library, uh, which allows you to listen to those change feeds and um, uh, publish those events to the uh, downstream. So after it has reached to this Cosmos DB trigger, what I am doing is uh, I am publishing this event uh, to an event grid topic. As we have seen earlier, the reason for doing this is so that like whenever uh, in future, like if you want to add uh, more subscribers to a particular event, you will be able to do that without incurring additional costs. And uh, you can you can add uh, uh, multiple subscribers to a particular topic. So uh, that is what it is depicted over here. And at the end, uh, from the subscribers, you can either directly reach out to uh, web up subservice, uh, which will publish or broadcast the message back to the Printer. So that is how the real time events are published to the uh, front end application where they can see uh, the chats are getting updated or the notifications are getting in the front end. Or there is a way uh, for the front end applications to directly communicate with the pub sub service as well with our sub protocol that we have seen earlier. So uh, there might be a case where you don't need to persist the data or you don't need to go through a set of uh, intermediate servers and you need to directly uh, communicate with the pub sub service so that it directly reaches the other clients who are listening to these events. Uh, one, one thing to consider here is like uh, uh, whenever you type a message like uh, in, in your WhatsApp or in your Facebook, like you would have seen, there is a little pop up showing um, someone is typing a message, right? So in this, like you don't need to really store these messages in your Cosmos DB. You just need to publish these events to directly to the pub sub service so that the other clients or the uh, the one who are who you are interacting with should know like you are typing. So for that scenario, you can directly communicate with the Azure Web sub, -Sub service. So now let's uh, consider some of the uh, design consideration that I have taken like uh, when I was building this um, uh, cosm the cosmic chat application. So one of the main thing I consider is um, uh, replicating for the multiple partition keys. What I mean by that is 
consider this is going to be a one portion of our application that is going to be the chat application here you could see uh, in the leftmost side uh, you can see list of chats that you have already communicated with so these are list of people that you are already communicated with so the one way of querying these um, uh, or getting these uh, list of documents would be going by the user id uh, the current login user id so that would be the better partition key for this set of operation and for the rightmost corner that you could see here is the list of messages for a particular chat item. So uh, the one way of going about this is like you can ha consider having chat ID as your partition key. So uh, there are different partition keys for different purposes here, but you are having only one business use case. Like you just need to type your message and you need to consider both these scenarios in your real world. So uh, one way of doing this is uh, with the help of change field because uh, consider like there might be other scenarios as well, like uh, um, an application can be a read heavy or write heavy application as well, or uh, there might be a similar case where you might also end up like where you want to query on different parameters and you want that to be an, in an efficient way. So, so uh, you can, you can uh, make use of change field uh, in order to replicate these partition keys or replicate these documents into two different containers. So we can see that uh, how it is done in this Cosmic Chat application. So uh, Cosmic Chat is the container where all the uh, messages are stored. So you can see uh, I have chosen chat ID as a partition key for this container. So whenever they click on a particular chat item, so I'm going to use this chat ID as my querying um, uh, filtering option so that the, uh, all the messages for that particular chat will be uh, retrieved uh, in a faster pace. And uh, uh, once I done this, like there is a change field listening to this container, which will duplicate this data to a different container with a minimal set of data. So I will be normalizing these data as well, uh, which is required for me to show that lip portion of the uh, chat application where I need to show to whom I sent message and what is the last message that I have sent and also um, the, the icon of it. So, so those things I need to store it in a different container with a different partition key. So now the partition key that you could see here is the user ID. So whenever I retrieve the left portion of the screen, I use this user ID as the partition key. And whenever I uh, uh, retrieve the list of uh, messages, it is going to be the chat ID. So this is one way of going about like how to uh, replicate your uh, uh, multiple partition keys. So let's see uh, a quickly uh, demo on this one. So let me refresh it because I have uh, uh, opened this for a long time. So uh, the pop up service, uh, I have made it uh, uh, available for one hour. So let me refresh this. So in the topmost portion, you could see uh, this is going to be the Azure Maps that I have integrated with this application. So uh, as when I log in, you could see there are a list of markers getting updated. So this is based out of an uh, Cosmos DB container, which is having a change feed, uh, which is going to publish an event to the web app subservice so that like it updates each of these markers. So as when a new user is going to join in, so that marker is going to instantly get updated in this uh, particular uh, page. So let's see, like, um, uh, this is going to be the chat application. And the one that you could see here is the uh, list of tasks that are assigned to a particular user. So these are list of tasks, like once you complete a particular task, like sending high Cosmos path to a particular user, you will be awarded with two points and you will be able to see that the list of scores is getting updated in a real, a real time. So these are different scenarios that I made use of the Cosmos DB in order to work with these different uh, things. So if I chat someone, uh, like if I, if I chat with someone from the new rally, so I will be rewarded with a point, uh, two points and I will be a top scorer now so so that that will be a different use case so let me uh, also log into a different account so to show you how the um, uh, chat application works let me have it side by side So, so now I'm going to interact with a different user. So when 
I start typing. You could see there is a little pop up showing here. Uh, Divaka Kumar has started typing. So, this is something um, I have published directly from the client to earn web apps of service. And whenever I post um, uh, a message here, so, so that will go uh, about like it will first reach us to the uh, web app sub service so that like it, uh, it shows, so shows you uh, like Divaka Kumar is typing. And then like uh, it, it, it will reach us the, um, so there is a cold start because I am running in the Cosmos DB serverless mode. So, so you might expect a cold start for this one. And you will be able to see like the messages has been retrieving and uh, it will be shown in the, um, in, in the in the other other users type so so this is how the change bit works so and the entire flow works so i will get back to the uh, slide maybe and i will show you a slide on how this thing works so this is the entire data flow that you can see uh, in the entire application i'm not going to confuse you with this entire flow so consider uh, i'm just going to consider one of the scenarios that is going to be the leaderboard update so there are different containers I have taken into consideration for this one. So one of the main thing is the cosmic chats where the list of messages gets added. So I'm the, the, the one of the events that I'm listening is the cosmic chats dot updated event. So I'm going to publish this event to the event grid subscriber. So it is going to update a new container where I'm going to store a normalized data of it. And uh, I'm going to use that for a different logic. So um, there is a different container known as cosmic user task which uh, list all the tasks for me uh, for an allocated timestamp. So this will uh, subscribe to a uh, different uh, container, which will update the leaderboard score. And it will um, uh, trigger a different change with uh, event, which will again uh, call a different subscriber, which is going to be a leaderboard score update. So that is how the entire flow works. Like now the from this subscriber, it directly uh, published the message to the web of service and then it uh, publishes the events to the front end application. So this is how the entire flow works uh, within this application. And um, I think that's all I had for sharing. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Divagar. I think that's an awesome uh, scenario and the demo you covered. Even at Microsoft, we know that uh, you know one of our uh, favorite collaboration tools team is using Cosmos DB to enable so many features uh, using change feed. I think it's one of the favorite topic among developers as well. Uh, can you talk more about uh, uh, what are the deployment configurations of each uh, resources that you spoke about, like Azure Static Web Apps, Azure Functions, even Grid, and then uh, PubSub? And have you estimated the total cost for this application? Because uh, this looks like an interesting app. Probably other developers would be interested yeah. to build something like this, yeah. Exactly. So since this is going to be a demo application, so whatever I have considered is in the serverless mode. So uh, right from the Azure function, it runs in the serverless mode and as well the Cosmos DB that is going to run in the serverless mode. So there are different scenarios where you need to consider different modes as well with respect to the Cosmos DB. So in Cosmos DB, there are other modes like a manual throughput and uh, auto provisioning. So uh, uh, if, if you are gonna go ahead with the Cosmos DB as a serverless mode, you, there is a trade-off like you need to note. Uh, don't know. So because now you will be having only single region capability, so you won't be having this global distribution or um, the feature that you have with other modes. Like you, you don't have that in the Cosmos DB serverless. But it just works fine for me since this is gonna be a demo application and. Um, um, the the, the cost is much cheaper, um, but haven't uh, 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 gone through or looked at it because I just completed this uh, entire application uh, just a few few days back. So it might take for me uh, time for me to consider those things as well. But I would see like uh, since I have considered even grid as my intermediate uh, uh, pops up pattern, so uh, there is a cost reduction in that as well. So now I don't need to pay an extra cost for having different leases per function or having a shared uh, leases. So uh, there is a uh, per million uh, free connections that you will be getting for the event grid as well. So that, that is more than sufficient for this demo application. But in the real world, you need to consider other things as well uh, when you are considering designing the application. All right, I think uh, you, you answered most of my questions. Uh, Sweta, do you have a question? 
Yeah, um, so Vivaka, you've used uh, functions at two places in the architecture, you know, to write to Cosmos DB and also read. So um, just was curious to know what was the experience of that integration? What were some best practices that you learned? Um, yeah, so one of the easiest way to uh, listen to these change periods using the Cosmos DB trigger, uh, which uses this push model. So you don't need to um pull the model uh, like uh, you don't need to uh, have your own pace like there might be a scenario where you need to have your own ways own pace of pulling these messages from the change field but this acts in a way like whenever there is a um, message or modification to a particular document it acts as in, a, in a push model so the cosmos yeah. db trigger uh, kicks in or else you can um, uh, design your own uh, library out of this change with processing library, which would uh, incur you an additional time. So if you are, right. if you want to make already an existing uh, usage of the Azure functions, you can go about with this Cosmos DB trigger, or else you can rely on the change with processing library because internally Azure function is also uh, uh, going to use the CFP for the for the processing. Makes sense. Thanks. Thanks again, Devakar. This was a wonderful session and uh, every business does have its own website. So uh, many of them may need to uh, offer differentiated experience to their customer and looks like uh, something, a chat feature like this will be super helpful for other um, developers and app providers as well. Right, Sajid? I think you are. Yeah, I think you are spot on, Sweta. Uh, it's a real challenge to create uh, something like this, like global uh, scale real time application, uh, like uh, where you can collaborate with uh, among others. Right. So thank you, Divagar, for this amazing session uh, with the cool demo that you, you showed. Uh, you have shown us uh, how easily it is to solve this type of challenges using Cosmos DB and various components on Azure. Thanks again. Uh, all right. Uh, let's move to our uh, next session. Uh, we have one more interesting speaker today. Our next presenter today is Rajdeep Sengupta. He's just 19 years old, uh, who is just completing uh, year one of bachelor in computer science. He's going to talk about how we, how he went from uh, not knowing what Cosmos DB was to build a full-fledged, full-stack web application in one month. Uh, he has built a virtual app called Bookly that uses the Cosmos DB with cognitive search. We are excited to have you here and uh, to hear more about your learning and also the journey with Cosmos DB. Over to you, Rajdeep. Thank you, thank you. Hey everyone, myself Rajdeep Shingupto. Uh, I'm a first year BTEC computer science student from Hate Institute of Technology. So let's get started with the session. As the session name suggests, hearing about Cosmos DB to building a full stack web app within a month with Cosmos DB. So there will be a mixture of tech and story on how we built a web app within a month that reached Microsoft Imagine Cup finals and top eight in India in education category. And all of this using Cosmos GB as our main database. And this is going to be a basic session on why we choose Cosmos DB uh, over any other databases and how to create a you know, Cosmos GB database, how to integrate with it, it with cognitive search, and also how to connect it with uh, Next.js web app and with the MongoDB API. So first things was how it all started. It was around end of November when I received a mail from Microsoft saying that I started for the 2022 Imagine Cup. And uh, the email is so good. We are thought like, why not? We should give it a try. And we registered for Microsoft Imagine Cup. So, when we were just reading through the rules and regulations, we noticed an, uh, a point saying that we must use the Azure tool or Azure service in the project. Back then we have completely zero knowledge about what is Azure. We researched about Azure a lot. And after a lot of searching, reading the blogs, official documentation and videos, we decided we'll use Azure Cosmos DB as our main database, Azure Cognitive Search for advanced search feature in our web app. Azure Geocoding and Geolocation APIs to enable location functionalities and Azure Maps for the map functionalities. And from then, within the first week of January, we are able to build a full stack web app with Azure Cosmos DB as our main database. Now, there are lots of reasons why we choose Cosmos DB as our main database over MongoDB or any other database. So move on to that part. 
so why we choose cosmos db as our main database and why you should also choose cosmos db as your main database so the first point is ease of use it is really easy to build apps on using language of your choice with sdks for net java node.js and python or your choice of drivers for any other database apis like we used mongodb in the case Azure Cosmos DB schema-less service automatically indexes all your data regardless of data model to deliver blazing fast queries. And the whole database is fully managed, so there is no maintenance. The next part is, as we are students, this point is really important for us. It's really cost-effective. As it is a fully managed database service, automatically there is no touch, no maintenance, no patching and update. So it saves developer time and also the money. It has cost-effective options for unpredictable workloads for any size or scale, enabling us to get started easily without having to plan or manage our capacity. A serverless model offers spiky workloads, automatic and responsive service to manage traffic burst on demand. And as we are using Next.js and building a serverless app is the best suit for us. It has auto-scale provision throughput automatically and it instantly scales capacity for unpredictable workloads. Now, the next point is speed and scalability. As our app is kind of a marketplace, we had a lot of data and we need it super fast. Cosmos DB offers real-time access with fast read and write latencies globally and throughput and consistency, all backed by SLAs. It also has multi-region writes and data distribution to any other region with a simple click of a button. While starting, we don't know the amount of data we will have and here comes Cosmos DB's independently and elastically scale storage and throughput across any Azure region, even during unpredictable traffic burst for unlimited scales worldwide. Now, the next point is MongoDB API. The Azure Cosmos DB API for MongoDB makes it really easy to use Cosmos DB as if it we are using a MongoDB database. You can leverage your MongoDB experience and continue to use MongoDB drivers, SDKs, and tools by pointing your application to the API or MongoDB accounts connecting to screen. And it's really helped us as we have previous experience with MongoDB, so the learning curve is almost zero for us. And one who had already experienced with MongoDB, for them, it's also going to be a zero learning path for using Cosmos DB. And with Mongo's on top of MongoDB, we can easily use .save, .find, and more easy to use fast new functions for fast development. Now, part the point is integration with Azure Cognitive Search. As we choose Azure Cognitive Search for advanced search functionalities in our web app, it was really easy to integrate Azure Cosmos DB database with it. Within a few clicks, we are all set to search data in our Cosmos DB database. Now, let's move on to creating a database in Cosmos DB, how you can create a database in Cosmos DB. So, so let's get started to Azure portal first. After signing in, you will be redirected to a dashboard like this. You may not have any recent resources like me if you're trying out Azure for the first time. You can find a lot of options, but for now, we can start creating a resource. So you can just click on the Create Resource button on the top left corner, and just you can just search for Azure Cosmos DB. You will find a page like this. Just simply click on the Create button to proceed. After that, you will have a bunch of options. Let's understand them. So the first one is Core SQL. This is the Azure Cosmos DB's native API. This uses a SQL query language, which is super popular. The second option is Azure Cosmos DB API for MongoDB. You can write simple MongoDB code and use Mongoose on top of that for your application. And with that, you use Cosmos DB as if it is MongoDB. The third one is Cassandra. This is also same as MongoDB. And you can use Cassandra database instead of MongoDB with the Cassandra API. Next one is Azure Table. It is suitable if you have existing code for Azure Table. Azure Table is yet another service offered by Azure. The last one is Gremlin. It's a graph database. If you have a graph database workload and that uses Gremlin, then it's the best option for you. Now I'm going to use Azure Cosmos DB API for MongoDB, and I'm going to choose MongoDB from the, those five options. The next part, we have to fill up all the details. I will use Azure Student Subscription, I have, I have it. You can choose whatever you have. Then choose the resource group. For now, I'm not 
I'm going to explain what is a resource group, but if you are trying Azure for the first time, most probably you will not have a previous resource group. So you can create a new resource group. Now for the account name, you can choose any. There are some limitations. You cannot use capital letters or there are some uh, basic limitations. You can just take care in that mind and you can choose anything for the account name. Now for the location, you can choose any Azure location, but try to have a database near to your users. Let's talk about capacity mode. For choosing a capacity mode, you can just refer to this table and you can just choose what you want. But in a simple words, if you have a predictable recurring traffic and you want low latency, then go for a provision throughput. And on the other hand, if you don't have a predictable workload, then go for a serverless one. This will be going to be a benefit for you. I will choose provision throughput for now and have a rest as it is. Now, in the, now see, the, see the global distribution section. I will disable both options because for now I don't want to distribute my database in multi-region. You can enable them to have more latency and better performance of your database all over the globe or the regions you choose. But remember, that will come up with some additional charges. So in the next section is networking. The first one is all network means you are allowing all networks or you can say everyone who has their credentials, database credentials, they can connect to you. The next one is public front end. This is when you want your web application or your mobile application only to connect to your database. Now, the last option is private endpoint. If you have a private server and only want that private server or only then want the private server's IP to connect to a database, then you can choose this option. For the sake of the simplicity, I'm just going to use all network in this demo. Now, the next one is pretty simple, is the backup policy. You can have a periodic backup and continuous backup, which is always on and which is always replicating your database to somewhere else. For this, I will be you know, choosing periodic backup for 240 minutes uh, in each hour. It will back up my data and choose the backup retention to be eight hours. That means a backup will be there for only eight hours. After that, new backup will be, will replace it. For the rest, it's pretty explanatory. Now, the next point is encryption. I'm going to choose service manage key because here you don't need to manage any key. Azure will take care of all of this. They will encrypt your database and you don't need to worry anything about the keys or anything. The second option is customer manage key. Here you need to manage your keys. The customer has the uh, keys, so you need to manage them. So for the for again the sake of simplicity, I'm just going to use the service manage key. So the next one is tag. If you want tags, you can add them, but it's an optional one. So I'm not going to add tags for this demo, but you can definitely add tags for better understanding. Now you can just review all the option until it validates. So you can say the estimated account creation time is two minutes. The subscription I'm going to use is Azure Students. The resource group is clueless. Location is West US. The account name I have chosen as the account. The API I'm going to use the Azure Cosmos DB for MongoDB API. The capacity mode is provision throughput. You can also choose serverless. The geo redundancy is disabled, and the multi-region rights is also disabled. For the backup policy, I choose periodic and the backup storage redundancy, geo redundancy backup storage I have chosen. For the connectivity method, I chose all network because for this demo, I want all the networks who have the credentials to connect, to be able to connect to my database. Now you can simply click on the create button. After that, you will see a page like this where your database will be created and the deployment will be in progress. You have to wait for two to five minutes to finish this process. If the process is successful, then you will see a page like this. After you can just click on the go to resource button and go to the database dashboard. Now you will find a dashboard like this and you can get pretty overwhelmed seeing this much of option. Just simply click on the data explorer and you will be redirected to a page like this. All the data will store can be browsed here. Here you can also create data manually. Now came back to a dashboard again. Uh, you will see there is an option uh, uh, saying connection string. So now here we are entering the part 
how you can connect a Cosmos GB database with the Next.js app. So now in the left navbar menu, you can see the settings connection string. And if you click on this, you can see all the credentials you have. You have the host, port, primary password, secondary password, primary connection string, secondary connection string, and the SSL. For this, you don't want this space to be shown to anyone. So I'm hiding all the data I have here. So you can just come here and copy the primary connection string from here. Now I'm just going to show you some code snippets that we exact the code snippets that we wrote in our application and explain them to you. First, you can just create an XJS app using NP NPX create next app and your application name in your terminal. After that, you can simply add a new folder named database and create a connect db.js in it. You can name them anything you want. So first, in, uh, first let me tell that I have also installed MongoDB and Mongoose as a dependency in my app. So in the first line, I'm simply importing mongoose, then building a function name connection DB. First, I'm checking if there if the client is already connected to the database or not, because the because in next days each time we run the connection DB function from the client side, this will connect to the database. But we don't want a single user to connect to the database for the multiple time. If a user is already connected to the database, we just return from the function. Then I'm then if that user is not connected, I'm just simply using the mongoose.connect function and using the Mongo, Mongo URL. And I'm here, I'm just uh, uh, put the Mongo URL in the env uh, folder because this is what you don't want to expose publicly. Now from then it's going to connect to the uh, database. Now, after that, you can just simply, we are just simply saying that if the Mongoose connection is connected, then we will be just console logging that is still connected to the database. And if there is any occur that will happen, we'll just simply log that error while connecting and the error itself. Now, in the next part, we'll be adding some data to the database. Now, let's see how we can add some data in the database. So first of all, we need to build a schema and Again, I'm just importing the mongoose in the first line. Then we are just building a schema named cell book schema. And this is the exact schema we used in our project named bookly. So here we're just simply using the mongoose function. So new dot mongoose schema and specifying all the uh, things we want. So here you can see the name, author, photo, condition, category, and all other stuff. So I'm just uh, marking something that like, uh, required or if the data is required or not. Now in the next part, I am just simply exporting it as a model. Now in the next part, let's just add some data to the database with this function. So first of all, I'm just simply importing the connection DB function from the you know, connection DB from the database slash connection DB. I'm importing also the cell book from the database slash model slash cell book. This is where we placed, this is a path of the function or you can say the files. Now I'm just validating the data second time in the backend. So after we get all the data from the requested body, we are just destructuring all the data. And then which are the required fields? I'm just uh, giving a if else statement for that. So there is if there is no name, no author, no condition, and all other stuff, if, if these are the required things, if they are not in the, then they don't come from the, Front end, the, 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 uh, uh, this is just going to return uh, an error saying that please fill all the fields. Now, in the next function, we are saving all the data in the database. Now, you have a uh, just we have all the data, and we are just all saving all the data using the new cell book uh, function. And using the dot save function, we are saving it all in the database. Now, at the end, I'm just giving it giving a status code of 201 that means something new is created and just returning the data that is actually created in the database back to the front end now if you store a data from here just simply the database data will be look like this there will be already a database data created there's a uh, new you will be created as underscore id 
and as we are using the mongodb api this will be called object id and you can find the object id there now you can see the name author photo and all the things we have in schema that is here as you can see the school is not a required field so you can just simply skip that that will come with a empty string or can be come with a null in your database now this is all from my side so thank you thank you for having me and i will want to thank azure cosmos db to give me a chance to talk in this conference Thanks, Rajit. Uh, I think it was great to hear from one of the Imagine Cup finalists here. You covered uh, about how you started with this application in quick time, and you also demonstrated step-by-step -step, uh, uh, instructions from creating the account to coding to uh, deployment. I have a question on uh, behalf of uh, beginners on Cosmos DB. Uh, what are the three most useful Cosmos DB resources uh, that you would recommend for any of your friends or even uh, for the beginners on Cosmos DB who want to actually get started with Cosmos DB? So the most important thing is like the official documentation. The official documentation is super good. You can just browse through it and you can find everything in it. But if you prefer videos, you can just see the Azure Cosmos DB channel itself. You have the Microsoft India channel where you can we just find something. So we have, to, we have used this too only and we just cover all the things in that we require. Thanks. OK. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Rajdeep. Um, um, can you also talk a bit about your application stack and architecture and what other Azure services you've used? Um, yeah. Yeah, so uh, you can find our application in bookly.versal.app. So this is a simple application where you can simply donate your book to its nearby NGOs. There's also you can sell your books, sell your secondhand books. So, uh, you can just uh, buy from there. You can also search through your college because in the most of the cases, if you are in college, you are in school, in the most of the time you are searching the books for your, to, to the seniors, not going, to, going outside of the college. So you can just search the book in your college if any one of your seniors have the book there. So in that case, we just use Next.js and this is a totally serverless app. We use the Next.js API routes for this one. And also, uh, here we use Azure Cognitive, uh, Cognitive Search because we don't want to implement the search filter because we don't have uh, much time to build all the search functionalities, like everything. So use Azure Cognitive Search for that. And with a simple few clicks, you can just import the database and the and Azure Cognitive Search will do a magic. And you have all the indexes, everything just lined up for you. You can just click on the next, next, and you don't need to configure anything to just filter, uh, to get the URL to filter all the data. And also, if I say the Azure uh, Congress, we use the Azure geolocation and geocoding APIs because we are just showing the area where the book is from. Because if you are buying a book and you need to know where from where the seller is, you can just you can you know, go for online payment or you can just uh, go go to him and take the book. So you are just uh, uh, allowing the users to see the area from where the book is. Also, we are using the geocoding and geolocation API for the search functionalities in the where we use the actually you, know, you can search the nearby NGOs with a simple two to three clicks after filling out a form that uh, with Microsoft uh, search APIs, we are just creating all the data or the all the nearby registered NGOs within a five within a five kilometer and we are all showing all the perfect latitude with the perfect latitude and longitude on the map with the azure maps and geocoding and the help of geocoding and geolocation api that's awesome so this will be super useful for all the students and like you said if anybody has old books to give away and stuff like that um so that's great uh, and uh, Rajdeep, you are still studying, and I'm confident that you'll be creating more apps down the line. So what's your next project using Cosmos DB? So we are using a mobile application this time. So this is going to be a mobile application that you can just scan any any medicine. You can just scan any medicine. You can just fill out your data and everything. Just you can scan any medicine, and it will tell you if the medicine is counterfeit for you or not. Just if you, you are just going to, going to store, mm -hmm. just scan any medicine and it will be saying you if the medicine is counterfeit or not. You can also see if there is in the online market, how you can, where you can buy, where the, what the price is, what you need to look up for that, like what are the things, uh, 
like what is the name, what are the compositions. Composition is not the most required, but in the most uh, important thing is, can you consume the medicine? If you have like diabetes, if you have sugar, there are some mm -hmm. medicines you cannot consume. So if you, it will give you a red alert. There are some uh, in the medicine section, like medicines and all other stuff, there are also some like expiry options. So the AI will detect all of this and give you all the expiry dates of that medicine. So you, know, you do, you're not going to consume any medicine that is already expired and all. That's awesome, Rajdeep. Thank you for your time. Uh, this was a great session. Firstly, uh, you showed us how to use uh, Cosmos DB as a virtually limitless database and how other full stack developers can use it to build applications quickly and deploy their app to cloud with static web app generators like Versal uh, and static web apps. Uh, and I'm also super excited to see um, your enthusiasm about solving more of these real life problems. Uh, isn't it Saji? Yeah, I think I'm inspired by this session. Uh, he spoke about the applications that he's planning to build. It's great to see that, you know, yeah. how he has uh, uh, used the stack, full stack uh, web app using Cosmos DB in quick time by leveraging all the capabilities. Uh, he talked about the SDK capabilities that we have and the, the learning curve, uh, which he mentioned as very simple. And uh, hope to see many more applications from you, Raj, Raj Deep. Thanks again for joining us today. Uh, Sweta, I think it's time to move to our last segment. Yep, yep, Saji. So our last session for APAC segment today is by Subhashish Ghosh. Uh, he is a cloud solution architect at Microsoft, and he enables uh, the customers uh, to build great solutions using the Azure platform. Uh, hey, Subhashish. Uh, Subhashish is, is here to talk about how he enabled one of our Microsoft customers to migrate a graph solution from MariaDB and MongoDB for fraud analytics using the Azure Cosmos DB Gremlin API for faster performance, higher resilience, and better TCO. Uh, that sounds like a very interesting story of choosing the right database for the right use case to me, Subhashish. So over to you. Yeah, hi, Shweta. Hi, Saji. I hope I'm audible. Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. Um, so I'll quickly uh, jump into the use case. Um, as you've already articulated, right? Um, it, ha it so happens that you know I kind of uh, worked with a lot of customers, and uh, you know this specific use case. Uh, again, though we are deep diving into uh, this specific use case, where uh, let's say the customer is uh, you know kind of created, uh, you know let's call it real time analytics uh, on a specific uh, type of transactions which are coming through credit cards. But uh, the learnings and the key design decisions that we will cover, I'll try to cover, given our time uh, you know, score, uh, definitely applies if you're also building real-time, let's say, recommendation engines or your, for your e-commerce portal or you're building a you know, social media you know, analytics uh, you know, platform for, you know, let's say, building a personalized marketing campaign and so on. Uh, so for this particular use case, right, initially the customer had built, let's call it a a solution involving what we call traditional RDBMS, you know, databases. So when you build a graph solution on top of that, we basically call it a RDBMS vertical graph solution. And they use a schema, basically, you know, I've taken a kind of a representational image is what we call a link table design approach. So what's the, you know, some of the very important numbers related to the use case so that you have an idea of what kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, volume or veracity we are talking about. So first of all, this is all real time. Um, and nodes or vertices, right? Talking about what we had like around two billion, um, and uh, you know around relationships between the vertices, which we call edges, right? Around four billion, uh, give and take. So write volume TPS forty million per day means it basically varied from let's say five hundred per sec uh, when non peak and to at uh, highest peak let's say five thousand per sec, and but that's the write volume and the query volume is it's a mixture of let's say. Mostly we try doing impartition queries and some point reads, uh, but also upserts are there. So it's more of a, a you know write heavy, but with also you know some volume of query volumes as well, where you have some complex queries and you know a lot of point reads as well. So the point reads was around 250 to 300, um, let's say TPS per sec, uh, and the number of graph queries per transaction used to vary between 40 to 50. So as you see, right, um, because it's a link table design approach, I mean, 10 years back when the customer kind of built uh, the solution. In fact, I worked with very similar a couple of other customers as well. Uh, they had all used a combination of different, 
you know, databases which were available to them at that time. So for example, in this particular use case, the link, uh, you know, table, or let's call it the linkage data was stored in MariaDB, um, and the node, the edge detail data, you know, we stored, it was initially stored in MongoDB. And uh, what kind of traversals are you talking about? Uh, so more basic traversals were do, done again using, you know, relational join queries. So basically they were using a mix of primary plus foreign key relationships. And uh, just for folks who are interested in total DB sizes. So uh, we are talking about what, 6 billion database objects here, two plus four. So the two billions were around, let's say 0 0.5 KB. That's like uh, one followed by nine zeros. That's like one TB. And, uh, you know, you're talking about uh, the edges being one KB per edge object. That's around uh, you know, four or five TB. So give or take uh, 4.5 or five TB of data you're talking about. Uh, just if I move on to what are what was the you know query patterns which they were doing, and that's also one of the key reasons why you know more and more customers we see modernizing using you know Cosmos, is um, uh, because it's relational, right? The top query patterns are all relational. So primary ops was a combination of insert update of the node edge you know rows. Like let's say for a customer, cust A, if I say so, I want to retrieve. At a given instant of time, let's say all entities which are linked to the customer. Uh, so let's say, uh, you know, how many distinct, let's say, credit cards do you have? How many credit cards, distinct cards did this particular customer use in the last 90 days? Uh, you know, how many uh, customers, let's say, shared a credit card with this person? So, you know, you get some information about not just the distinct discrete data points, but also, you know, uh, also ask all sort of questions about this customer vis-a-vis -vis his or credit card being. We will limit our conversation there because this was purely to understand the credit card discrete usage. Uh, but the key point to note here is it's not just from the customer to his me email and so on, but also we want the, the you know, basically the solution required, um, let's call it um, uh, architecture pattern where we could do by directional travel. So that was a bit becoming a bit difficult once you are on the relational RDBMS vertical graph solution. And we will take a look at some of the code, you know, design uh, patterns as well. We uh, kind of chose. Uh, they became very key for scaling this, uh, you know, particular solution up. Uh, now, if I talk about what kind of, so as I mentioned, the primary was the write operations in MariaDB, which included like insert update of uh, like node edge rows, but we also had considerable amount of, you know, point reads as well. Uh, now, what was the need for modernization? That's like a very important point to understand. Again, um, without like very basic generalization, because this varies from use case to use case. But in this particular use case, you know, when uh, we got involved with the team, there were fundamentally multiple, you know, challenges. But if I take the top four, um, you know, reasons for modernization, the first was handling the complexity of data growth. Now, I want to touch upon this, uh, you know, very important point that when I say handling the complexity of the data growth, right? Uh, we are not meaning that uh, storing, you know, terabytes or petabytes of data, correct? The persistent layer was a challenge. No, that was not uh, the, you know, what do you call it? The reason uh, specifically for use cases, if you are doing fraud detection, fraud analysis, recommendation engines, right? The common pain point that, you know, I have seen working with customers over the past three, four years, right? Very actively is as your data grows in a relational data store and the deeper, you basically want to kind of dive. Storing data is never uh, a core issue. Uh, the key challenge gradually becomes not just managing the discrete data points, but let's say a data point here is a record, which let's say in graph, we call it a vertex, right? But it also very essential to these use cases is understanding and traversing the relationships between them um, and between these distinct data points. So uh, this easily fits into what we call uh, discrete data and relational tables. So connected data and managing connected data becomes a, quite of a challenge. So for example, this customer specifically, when we did not 1x, but 2x, 3x travel sales and more, again, not on 20 million, 40 million objects, but exceeding 100 million plus objects. When I say an object, I mean uh, across an edge we are traversing, right? Um, uh, given, let's say a 1kb or a 2kb uh, you know, limit on our edge, we found that neither the performance, uh, neither latency was good, and also it incurred you know, cost in terms of uh, doing complex querying using standard relational join queries. In other words, 
not just the traversing bit of it, but if you want to get millisecond level latencies in completing this traversals, it becomes very important to kind of look uh, at uh, optimized, you know, graph solutions and uh, move from vertical graph solutions into something which can give you horizontal scale. Uh, number two, of course, this particular solution built over to RDBMS solutions lacked, you know, scalability in traditional on-premises. HA was no part of the solution, but the team needed to kind of scale the server during peak times. Um, there was no SLAs per se in most of the customer use cases I worked. Uh, they wanted dedicated SLA on performance if it's available. Uh, definitely uh, on the last mile read latency, write latency, throughput would be excellent to kind of, you know, uh, estimate and also optimize for. These two are very, very important points. And then, of course, because of the lack of the, you know, above mentioned points, there was a poor TCO, you know, for this particular use case. So basically, our recommendation was to use or check out Azure Cosmos DB, uh, you know, for, uh, let's call it um, uh, Azure Cosmos DB Kremlin API. And uh, uh, since 80% of the query traversals uh, basically, uh, you know, were using, uh, let's say, edges. So we basically wanted to kind of, uh, you know, understand and also uh, show the customer the value prop of the Gremlin API with your Cosmos DB. So let's quickly take a look at, uh, you know, some of the key points, uh, you know, so that it's clear. Uh, so I'll just show you a sample code of something which uh, very much represents the customer use case, but this is not the exact customer code. Uh, just for a pointer. So this is in Visual Studio. We're using basically the Gremlin.NET, you know, driver. Um, and uh, while we, you know, kind of go through the code, we'll also talk about some key design decisions uh, we kind of, uh, you know, specifically uh, took a look at. So as you can see, for example, these are standard Gremlin, uh, you know, constructs. So when you're adding a vertex, right, you're basically mentioning a label because, uh, you know, for us, the Gremlin API, which is an Apache Tinker Pop standard, basically, allows you to build what we call property labeled uh, you know graphs uh, you had an id which we you know assigned uh, to the vertexes and then you had multiple properties for example for this particular use case you know we stored the first name last name property when there's this customer on board onto this e-commerce platform let's assume uh, when did they use their last credit card what credit card was it uh, what was his age now this is a very 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 important point that's the partition key choice Possibly the most important design, uh, you know, decision for your, uh, you know, Cosmos DB, uh, let's say, data model. Now here, I would like to touch upon one important thing. So if you see this, basically, right, this partition key choice. So it's basically a combination of my uh, label and uh, along with the ID. So we kind of uh, tinkered with a couple of use cases. Uh, we tested out just using, uh, let's call it a uni a unifier or identifier kind of a global, uh, you know, UID. Uh, we also created a partition key, a synthetic partition key with a concatenation of both, right? And we also wanted, uh, we also tried checking out using a random, you know, number generator. Now, one important point to note here is, uh, can I replace this, uh, you know, synthetic partition key with a random number, you know, or as a random suffix appended to my UUID? You can, but again, the correct answer would be like, it depends really varies on the use case to use case. For example, I worked on a couple of use cases where it was extremely write heavy, but you did not, once you've written or updated a vertex, you never practically read it or, you know, delete it or do any operations. You don't know much of a traversal. In such case, you know, for very good or excellent write latency, it's good to have something which has very high cardinality. But for our given use case, we also had a post write, of course, an update of vertexes. We also had a considerable amount of point reads. Uh, so if you have a unique, you know, let's say a random, uh, you know, prepended suffix or a prefix, right, it becomes very difficult to read uh, a specific item. So that's basically the fundamental reason why we kind of chose a synthetic, uh, you know, partition key. Uh, another important point was a design decision. And again, we tested these out, actually. That's the correct, you know, way of testing it out. Another very important uh, design requirement for this solution when we were basically discussing, right, was to have or the ability of where we have different kinds of relationships, but between the same vertexes. For example, in this, uh, you know, I have shown, for example, this particular, uh, let's say, vertex, Subishish, let's say, uh, knows uh, the second vertex, Kolabiji. 
uh, but it's also possible that you know Subhashish knows him because he's working with him uh, both our colleagues so, uh, so because that's also a fundamental reason when you're trying to study something like analytics you know fraud analytics or social media analytics you want to understand uh, the different types of the relationships between these same vertexes. So that was also a very important design decision that was a bit difficult, uh, uh, you know, when we tried remodeling this with the other, you know, databases on offer. I mean, that's the input that we have received. Uh, then very important was, uh, you know, let's say when we update the vertexes, we counted these standard, you know, gremlin, uh, you know, operations. Another very important point is how do you limit or optimize for cost and latency? Is basically if you can you know restrict or design your queries in such a way that they are in partition queries. So basically, you give the has with a you know partition key along with and restrict. So you know that um, that particular query is scoped to the logical partition where uh, the data resides for that given partition key choice. Uh, the of course we had uh, traversals, so we tested out the basic traversals, the traversals for one x for two x. For example, this one specifically is for folks that know customer one, but also has, uh, you know, also knows customer two. Uh, then we basically had query patterns like this. For example, we wanted to understand all people older than a certain age and then more, you know, create more complex, you know, relationships between them. Then we basically wanted to understand that all persons were sorted. Uh, then people who this particular customer knows and people also known by those who this particular customer himself knows. Uh, so these were very important in trying to understand if there is a pattern between uh, them in uh, any of the usage of any blocked credit cards or any cards which had blocked in, uh, you know, APIs to it or device specific IDs or device UIDs specific to that. Uh, one important also point which we uh, leveraged and, uh, you know, we strongly recommend people leveraging is always to use the execution profile. Uh, this is extremely important because it kind of gives you a lot of, uh, you know, the uh, parameters for which you can then deep dive into for optimizing queries, you know, specifically from performance perspective and then eventually moving into latency and then cost. Uh, and another very important point is for all of these queries, uh, you know, you have the status attributes. So the status attributes kind of prints out um, basically, you know, um, uh, the retry after milliseconds as basically, and also the unique identifier for the operation. So we used all of these, uh, and we also used status attributes specifically for getting the, uh, what we call total server time and the total request charge. So if I kind of um, share the output on the screen, um, like let's say these are add vertexes, but let's say specifically, I will go to an operation, which is, um, let's say I'm doing a basic traversal. Uh, correct. I would like to know what's the you know, status code. So we have a uh, provide a list of status code, actually be status codes. And very important for us is to check the total you know, execution time and the request charge, uh, which the REUs utilize for this query. So the recommendation is, and what we did was we tested out on the top 25 uh, queries and we wrote down uh, specifically for the 1x, 2x, 3x, till a certain end level depth, uh, the query patterns, and we tested out also how we could kind of optimize using the execution profile, of course, uh, and decrease the server time, execution time, and also the uh, optimize for the request charge. Can I bring this 10 to 3, 6, 2, let's say 8, or 5, or 6? Uh, this again is a very important you know, design uh, decision. Uh, now, if I go to the portal, this is what exactly technically it looked like. I mean, of course, for 4 billion, uh, you know, what do you call uh, edges, it will be much more complex in nature, which and we also utilize a third party, uh, you know, tool specifically for, uh, you know, visualization of this, uh, you know, let's say graphical representation. But as you see, the most important point, uh, the fundamental reason why we wanted to test out uh, or kind of enable this customer to migrate from a relational, you know, join specific vertical graph to something which is horizontally partitioned and lets you create complex relationships was again on the you know basis of allowing them to store different type of edges and then traverse those edges to do operations, you know, on them. And then, of course, as patterns emerge, you can feed them down to different downstream applications. Um, and specifically, for example, uh, if I go back. 
to the uh, presentation, I wanted to. Yeah, so basically the troubleshooting aspect of it, uh, you know, definitely the recommendation is used to use the execution profile, uh, which gives you an execution plan. And we use this very actively for optimizing, uh, uh, what do you call it, um, a majority of the queries. Uh, another important point, which I wanted to quickly uh, highlight is uh, the design decision choice, which is how do you effectively model for partitioning? I mean, this is a much larger discussion uh, because partitioning, again, you know, uh, is a complex topic, but it's extremely well handled on your behalf by Azure Cosmos DB. So it uh, handles it automatically. Only detail that you need to take care of, uh, which, you know, when you're in the pilot stage or you know, testing it out is uh, ensuring that you take care of the partition key, um, which allows you to kind of attain, you know, scale. Another thing that we also optimized for um, was to keep in mind uh, how do you design and optimize in partition versus cross partition queries. That is, there will be cases when you'll be traversing a graph which is connected across two partitions. Because, you know, technically, though you may say that, you know, Cosmos DB provides you unlimited scale, but we have a logical, uh, you know, partition limit of uh, 20 GB, right? So it's basically if you're talking about um, one object of 1K. Uh, so you're basically, uh, you know, talking about 20 million graph objects, you know, give and take. So estimating a total, you know, data size again is a, something which is very important, which we effectively did. And uh, that is very important because you can then check or test out your level of traversals effectively where you can restrict. I mean, though in Cosmos, uh, every, uh, you know, outgoing edge is co-located with the vertex uh, for you. But um, you know, how do you optimize and kind of uh, take care of this logical partition limit of 20 GB is something which is you should definitely take into consideration. Uh, choosing a partition key, I already covered, you know, something which has high cardinality, but again, which can distribute throughput storage and operations for you, uh, give and take, again, uh, a combination of uh, to both of these. Um, and then um, another very important, uh, you know, consideration was um, cost measuring. Now, uh, for this, we basically used a combination of both, you know, client libraries, uh, you know, as I mentioned, uh, um, but there are certain practices and patterns which you should uh, be aware of. For example, G.V, uh, that's not a very good query pattern because it's equivalent to a RPMS table scan, right? Uh, then again, G.V V1, like if you just give the identifier, like it basically what, you know, fetches a vertex um, that has a specific ID, not a very efficient thing because it's not possible to kind of uniquely identify a logical partition by the vertex ID only. Um, so g.v1 dot has given that primary key. I mean, that is a good way of writing a query, right? So these also, again, are very important things which we took in, into consideration, right? And we tested out uh, continuously the costs of the top 10, top 20, top 25 queries, including the top four levels of traversals. That's a you know good practice um, for cost measurement. Uh, and then, of course, optimizing it for latency, performance, and cost. Um, another also best practice uh, which is recommended, which uh, you know kind of we did, or uh, you know, uh, is basically to write down your query patterns for your given use case, and then try and estimate and come to an estimate sizing in terms of the total cost. Uh, again, this is a very simplistic or rather oversimplification of our use case. Uh, but in real time, for example, as you see, I have given the vertexes. Uh, you have taken a sample code. I have tested out using code what's the number of RUs required for execution. Then you basically know for your use case the TPS. Then this is where in the real life you would like to kind of check out TPS for the on peak versus off peak periods because you won't have 10 TPS, let's say, throughout the, throughout the day, right? You will have times when you will have very low TPS, you will have peaks when it will be 10x or 5x of the TPS. And then you get to an average of adding both the two off peak plus the on peak you know tps and come to a total rdu right I mean, we did this very effectively for um, many of the customer use cases i worked on and it was very relative to what uh, their sizing was eventually of course given take some of the operations which were over and not covered in these you know top 10 or top 20 queries but once you have an idea of what kind of vertex you're adding what's the length of the edge what's the number of properties 
that you're gonna you know traverse uh, usually when you're traversing and uh, then the what's the level of uh, you know updates you're doing uh, for example are you just updating the vertex or is it mostly very little creation of the vertex and the you know edges which you are mainly updating uh, point read something which is very efficient um, uh, basically you're bypassing the query operator so you're directly you know going to the end point of the uh, physical partition where the data is residing right so uh, point reads uh, you can definitely optimize for but as we saw for our particular use case let's say you know we had uh, around 10,000 TPS and when we scaled it up let's say on big is much higher as well so your design decision of the partition key choice again has to be accordingly you know decided on that uh, then the traversals uh, very very key uh, we basically for our use case uh, studied 1x uh, in detail, 2x also in detail, uh, till 3x, not beyond that. Um, because again, there has to be a very important uh, point which needs to be mentioned there. Though we are referring it as a uh, media analytics or a social media engine you're building or graph analytics or let's say fraud analytics, uh, but technically you should leverage, you know, uh, let's say uh, building OLTP transactions. Uh, using Azure Cosmos DB Gremlin API. And that's also one of the tips or design decisions, which is the last slide I have, um, which was some of the key learnings that we you know, optimized for and picked up as we you know, built the use case. That is, we wrote down the key query patterns, we effectively estimated data size, uh, we chose the partition key effectively, uh, we did tweak a couple of data, a couple of pilots, uh, we estimated effectively and early, very important, and then eventually optimized for query latency and cost. And then if there were large volume OLAP workloads, uh, then it's always good to offset that to Spark using the Spark connector and then basically you know, process it over there. Uh, so that's uh, you know, something which uh, technically uh, you should be aware of and you should be kind of uh, uh, you know, take away from here. So that's the uh, you know, uh, crux of it uh, you know, in terms of what we um, did, what we achieved, and of course, uh, given the uh, you know, use case, um, uh, the, the total amount of volume of the queries that we have uh, is easily handled, uh, is also the latencies are optimized for, and um, at 100 million plus objects uh, for the pilots that we have done and for some of the use cases that I worked in production as well, uh, the optimization of the queries if properly done with the choice of the partition key and result in really you know highly performant uh, systems for you, which of course you can then leverage other things uh, with downstream applications and other integration of other services in Azure, right? And build a holistic solution. Um, so vertical graph, if you have built or using a link table approach design, uh, definitely do test out uh, you know Azure Cosmos DB, and it will enable you to build really you know highly scalable graphs with. Uh, you know, low latencies and highly performant, and which you can dip with different tweaks in place, which you can really optimize for, for getting, you know, the best uh, you know, juice out of your solution, let's call it. So that kind of brings me to an end uh, to this particular session. Great. Thanks so much, uh, Subhashish. Uh, this is, I would say, a great example of heterogeneous migration, right? And uh, we know that the job is not fully done even after the migration is completed. So uh, what are the tips and guidance uh, that you've shared with the customer to make sure that this data model uh, and setup is working well down the line? Uh, if it needs any optimization going further, maybe once their data size or their workload, or the, the number of requests grow, right? So what were your tips and guidance for that? Yeah, estimating data size specifically uh, is very key uh, in building a graph solution because yeah. uh, just it's not just about storing the vertexes, uh, but uh, one very important thing which we did was to, uh, before concatenating, was to strip down the vertex sizes uh, because mm -hmm. Cosmos for us is basically a, prop, it's a, it's a property labeled graph, right? So properties play a vital role when you're doing the traversals. Uh, so to ensure that you have the most optimized data format is also very key. It's not just about storing. So in our DMS, for example, we see relational, you know, often uh, formats or records have a lot of data in it, which may not be required for a given use case. 
it's better than mm. to kind of break the use case down into a graph solution versus a bit of it, which the maybe the node detail. It's good to still be on a relational database because the joins are much more simpler. You do not need sub millisecond latency, and there's no practically you know relationship traversal which is required. It's a pin point for a question, right? You can do it within an RD payment solution or a key value pair. So that was a very important uh, design you know discussion. We had lots of it around it. So to ensure, so often we see that um, uh, people uh, or rather, you know, customers that we work with talk about like, I have a five terabyte data. I would like to bring it to Cosmos DB and do a lot of operations on it. Though it's 100% yeah. possible, I would like to mention it, but that may not be the right approach for your given use case always. So to understand the data query patterns is more vital post or rather, you know, before you design uh, the data model. So we did that very effectively. And also this was discussed that as your data grows, again, uh, the discussion mm -hmm. has multiple points. Is it just the data volume growth you're talking about? That is, I will yeah. add more vertexes or will my use case change such that the properties and the number of properties will also grow? Because if mm -hmm. I grow them as well and I traverse, my RUs do not remain constant. They will also vary over a period of time. So my total sizing will inflate both in volume number of vertexes properties and also in the total sizing so then you know you have to revisit this data model after six months strip it down ensure that for your use case it's highly optimized then you will get sub millisecond latency or very low level latency so that's something which we of course you know it's open for discussion and you have downstream applications which feed into this analytics so you have to ensure also how do you upload that and if you have an olap kind of a workload where the data sizes are large Again, mm -hmm. recommendation is not to use Gremlin. Gremlin should be used only for OLTB. You should then possibly use a Spark connector to offload it to, uh, you know, Spark. So that is again a bit of the part of the solution which we are right now, let's say, working on. Makes sense. Thanks for answering, Subhashish. Yeah, I think uh, one more question from my side. I would ask, like, are you covered uh, one of the interesting scenarios on the fraud detection? Uh, in general, uh, how can we provide a full text search functionality on graph data? Okay, full text functionality. Um, I am not aware of, uh, but uh, okay. for us, it was like basically, uh, I did come across this use case was to feed it into Azure Cognitive Services and then use the indexing on the uh, you know query parameters in Azure Cognitive Services and basically use that indexer to search for the data. But then again, um, there are certain, I wouldn't call it caveats, but design decisions you need to kind of take into consideration. Like if your container source data changes, like how uh, effectively would you re-index or rebuild the index on the uh, you know, Azure search that basically is part of Azure Cognitive Search, right? We call it. So that uh, definitely is uh, something which we can take a look at. All right. Yeah, thanks, Subhashis, for joining us. I, I think it was a, a great session that we had from you. So thanks once again. I think we have come to the closing time of APAC live stream session. Uh, before we wind up, Sweta, what are your takeaways from the sessions we had today? A uh, few things that you want to highlight from the sessions we had. Yeah, Saji. So uh, firstly, I'd like to thank all the speakers for taking the time to come today and share their knowledge. Um, if I have to summarize, uh, Saji, in the first half today, we saw some interesting sessions from Heber, uh, from Grab, like, right? He spoke about uh, C3, uh, customer 360 personalization and um, especially highlighted how they make the best use of point reads for getting sub millisecond latency and how they use auto scale uh, rotating container strategy and um, apply to their use case for fraud transaction prediction right then we had brian uh, who's a startup founder he highlighted the do's and don'ts for developing quickly with cosmos db um, focused and uh, walked us through the architecture how they scale how they focus completely on their development and not on building infrastructure so um kind of making all the infrastructure and scaling problems irrelevant through infrastructure as code and automation. Um, then we had Sindhu. Um, she spoke about the important lessons and takeaways um, on migration of Cassandra from self-hosted to Cosmos DB API, right? Um, Saji, what were your takeaways from the second half of the sessions? 
Yeah, I think all the sessions were really awesome uh, and it was really informative as well. Even I got to learn many things from the sessions we had. If I have to summarize a few things from the second half, I think uh, Divaka showed us uh, how to leverage change feed to build a globally distributed real-time application uh, where you can uh, chat among others. So that is one of the greatest example on change feed. And then Raj Tip, uh, who is the Imagine Cup finalist, uh, and he's just 19 years old who was, uh, you know, demonstrating us how to get started with Cosmos DB and how to build a quick uh, full stack applications and shared some insights on how to, uh, you know, uh, get started and the resources that we need to go through uh, if you're getting started on Cosmos DB. And then final session we had from Subhashis. He spoke about one of the interesting scenario on graph uh, solution to migrate the database from uh, migrate the data from MariaDB to Gremlin API with some of the interesting scenario on fraud analytics covering some of the important concepts on uh, partition key choice optimization and then uh, cost and latency. Uh, overall, we had different topics uh, which would be definitely useful for the audience we had today, including the data analysts, uh, developers, startup founders, architects, and also the students, uh, starting from enterprise applications like 360 API to startup applications, where uh, we had a few sessions covering on startup, uh, startup security, fraud detection, and then some of the applications from chat, OSS APIs, integrations, and uh, you know, including search and functions like that. Uh, so that's a whole bunch of information and interesting sessions we had today. Uh, Sweta, do you want to call up anything before we actually close the segment? Yes, and this is not all, folks. Apart from these live sessions, we have 17 on-demand sessions for Azure Cosmos DB conference with even more amazing content from our community. So do watch these as well as any of these live sessions that you may have missed out on. Um, you can visit aka.ms slash Azure Cosmos DB conf to catch up with these on-demand and live sessions. Uh, you can also join us for our podcast, um, Azure Cosmos DB Live TV. Our host, Mark Brown, meets with members of the Cosmos DB team uh, regularly, as well as members of the community. You can catch up new episodes or check out the past ones at aka.ms slash Cosmos DB Live TV. Finally, if you are new to Cosmos DB and want to find ways to try out free, uh, read our blog post on the four ways uh, you can try Cosmos DB for free, which is available in ak.ms slash Cosmos DB for free. Uh, we have a few more sessions coming up in the EMEA time zone. Uh, if you had to catch up our next stream for the EMEA time zone sessions, our next stream will be uh, starting in three hours from now, which covers various interesting topics such as change feed, serverless, uh, security on Cosmos DB, and then uh, Kremlin API. I think that's all from us today. Uh, we hope all of you have enjoyed the APAC time zone friendly session. Uh, take a break and join us back uh, for the EMEA time zone session. Thank you once again, all the speakers, all the participants, and the wonderful audience uh, and the supportive members. Catch you again soon. Thanks. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Hope you have a wonderful day ahead.